All right. Hey, everybody. How is it going? Um, welcome to the West It Slay it, West and Slay at Home series. Um, really excited to have you all here. Um, we got an all-star crew lined up um, and also uh, some really incredible sponsors. I'm super stoked to have the Catamount Trail Association um, coming at you from Vermont, uh, Granite Backcountry Alliance from New Hampshire, uh, Outdoor Gear Exchange uh, in Burlington, Vermont, and then the Acadia Mountain Guides um, coming at you from Maine. And uh, we'll have panelists representing each give you the lowdown on what they do. So welcome everybody, excited to dive into all of the one, well not all, but just a sampling of all the wonderful places to uh, ski and ride in the backcountry of the Northeast. Uh, so first off, who am I? Uh, I um, do handle Weston's PR and communications. Um, I've been with the brand in varying capacities for four years. Uh, up until very recently, uh, the East Coast was my home. Um, I called Waterbury, Vermont and Bolton Valley uh, the, my hometown. Uh, I actually learned to split board at Bolton Valley, was the founder um, along with uh, Greg um, and Bolton Valley for the Split Fest back in 2015 um, and was very active in the community uh, until I recently moved for work. Um, so really excited to have you all here and moving right through the rest of our panelists. Uh, so first off, we have David Goodman, who wrote literally the book on backcountry touring. Um, and he also, fun fact, was my next door neighbor when I lived in Waterbury Center. Um, so really excited to have David and his wealth of knowledge um, on board. David, welcome. Would you like to tell folks about your book and, and what else you do? Sure. Um, I looks like i am you've got to undo my video here but um glad to join everybody and um i've been writing the backcountry skiing guidebooks to the northeast uh, this is the 30th anniversary edition that came out um hold on i've got a video thing here look at that i got a face as well as a voice um anyway 30th anniversary edition just came out a month ago and um Thanks to all these uh, backcountry crazed people, it sold out in two weeks. So the publisher, Appalachian Mountain Club, is now in its second printing. So there seems to be a little bit of interest in backcountry skiing right now. And I'm um, glad to join this cast of characters to talk about it. Cool. Thank you, David. Really excited to have you on board tonight. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, then we've got Greg from the Catamount Trail Association. Um, I got to know Greg uh, back in the day, uh, splitboarding early morning, very cold dawn patrols at Bolton. And also was, you know, I, I went to him with this crazy idea about a split fest. And this was when there was just a handful of us doing it. And he was like, hell yeah, I'll support this. So um, Greg, while a skier, has been a huge supporter of the splitboarding community um, and uh, does amazing work with the Catamount Trail, which has been a huge part of um, it and its local chapters have been a huge part of uh, really the success of backcountry skiing in Vermont. So Greg, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what the Catamount Trail does and, and why it's so important to our community on the East Coast? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Greg Mano. I work, I'm the communications director at the Catamount Trail Association. I'm actually, I actually started uh, snowboarding. Way, like I got into sliding on snow a little late in life. I started snowboarding and then got into skiing specifically to kind of better explore the backcountry. This was before split boards were super popular. Um, I'm actually a terrible skier and I'm an advocate for um, not getting rad in the backcountry and letting people know that it's okay if you, you know, um, are kind of like a timid skier. It's a great place to, like the backcountry is still for you. So just, just remember that you don't have to get rad. So here at the Catamount Trail Association, we consider ourselves um, kind of the gateway to Vermont's backcountry. Uh, we were founded 35 years ago, a little over 35 years ago, to take care of the Catamount Trail. Uh, but in the last eight years, um, we've kind of expanded beyond that. You know, we have we now work with chapters throughout the state to manage a variety of backcountry zones for splitboarding and kind of downhill-oriented backcountry skiing. Uh, we also are involved in conservation projects throughout the state, and uh, we are involved in events and tours. 
uh, to get people out there and make connections between people. Um, we're also involved, we also have community programs and, and youth programs to kind of uh, provide access to skiing for people that might not have uh, that ability otherwise. So, you know, we kind of take a holistic approach to helping people play outside in the winter. Um, and we manage terrain, uh, we, and we help get people get outside. So uh, I appreciate being here and I hopefully we can share some tips for you guys and help you guys get out as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Greg, and really appreciate all that uh, you do for uh, on the Catamount Trail and, and for the Vermont Backcountry Ski Community. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sweet. And then we have Tyler Ray, who um, it heads up the Granite Backcountry Alliance, which has done really incredible work in New Hampshire and Maine um, as far as offering and creating um, managed backcountry ski zones there. Um, really excited to uh, hear and learn more about the zones and all of the work that uh, Tyler and, and all the incredible folks over there have done. So thank you so much for being here, Tyler. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, what you have going on in New Hampshire and Maine. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Appreciate uh, being here. It's uh, uh, in good company here, so I appreciate it. Um, as I said, Tyler Ray, um, headquartered here in North Conway, uh, New Hampshire, and um, just on my my background, I own a outdoor advocacy firm uh, that uh, specializes in outdoor recreation advocacy work, and that's in the legal management consulting field, and uh, and that's all right on, right on outdoor recreation and that's something that i've you know committed to uh, professionally and you know matches up nicely with with my passions as well and um you know some people tell me hey that's that's really cool you, you do a lot of that stuff how do i get into that and i'm like well you know it took me like 20 years to, to figure it out so you know you got you got some time but i'm glad it's it's all culminated because uh, what got me into the outdoor industry was founding the granite backcountry alliance and what a what a what an experience it's been. Let me tell you, four and a half years. Uh, the first three years it was, feels like a just a, a blur. We developed um, eight glade zones, thirty thousand vertical feet. Uh, we man, maintained four uh, CCC trails. Those are historic ski trails um, in New Hampshire. We've expanded into Maine, so we're in two states. Um, we have an organization that has just shy of a thousand members. Uh, it's 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 just so much fun. Um, we've really been able to you know, take a fragmented community and, and really help cultivate it uh, with the help of everyone. And we've just been the facilitator and it's everyone's contributed and our glade days in the fall, I certainly encourage everyone to come on out and do that because, uh, you know, what we found is that uh, people think it's a lot of work, but, uh, you know, big deal. So what, 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 what you really fig figure out is that there's this social element to it, as well as a, um, a stewardship element to it. You really find there's an engagement in the land when you get out and roll your sleeves up and uh, help create these zones in a above board uh, permissible way. So we've been able to, um, uh, yeah, really, really change the way backcountry skiing has been as developed. Uh, historically, it's a little bit more of a clandestine operation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've worked with, you know, followed the lead of uh, some other great groups, Rasta and Greg CTA, and it's just been, it's just been a great and, and having the community um, just really thrive is is has been exciting. So we look forward to um, you know future development, and uh, we'll chat about some of that tonight. But uh, thanks for having me; really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for being here, and thanks for all the incredible work. It's been so fun to watch watch it grow over the last few years, and yeah. I, can imagine it was a blur those like I was just like every I feel like every time I like checked on what you were doing another zone was popping up so it was, it's been really fun to watch all the progress that you've made so amazing work and then also we have Carolyn Lawrence from Outdoor Gear Exchange. Um, Carolyn heads up their programming and events and is just all around uh, probably one of the most stoked humans that I know uh, and really excited to have her on the panel to uh, provide her insights to some of her favorite zones uh, here on the East Coast. So thank you so much for being here, Carolyn. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at OGE and, and how OGE supports the community? Yeah, thanks, Alex. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Carolyn. Uh, I'm the Community Relations and Social Media Manager at the Outdoor Gear Exchange. Uh, we're a very large uh, independent outdoor retailer here in Burlington, Vermont. 
We also have a website if you guys want to check that out. It's gearx.com. Um, but we're more than just an outdoor retailer. We are really focused and always have been on um, kind of inclusivity of outdoor recreation. So it's always been our goal to try and lower barriers to get into the outdoors for folks who may have been historically excluded from it. Um, so we have our own grant program. It's called the Charitable Grant Fund. Um, we are a lot of several thousand dollars each year to promote um, organizations like the Catamount Trail Association or they're a big partner of ours to help support their programs and a lot of other local Vermont uh, nonprofits here to help get other people outside. So yeah, thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Carolyn. And I also forgot to mention that OG is hands down my favorite shop. And even though I have moved away from Vermont, I still continue to shop from you online um, just because of all the incredible work that you all do to support the community directly. Um, I know outside of the backcountry ski, but mountain bike community, um, I know you funded a number of projects that I worked on in Waterbury and, and just really you all do such incredible work. So, so stoked to have you here and really appreciate it of all you do uh, for uh, the backcountry ski and outdoor community in New England. Cool. And then finally, we've got Rob from Acadia Mountain Guides. Um, I actually took my Airy Level 2 um, with Acadia. They are an incredible guide operation um, based out of Maine. Um, and we're super lucky to have Rob joining us to, to give uh, his perspective um, and the lowdown on what's going on over in Maine and northern New Hampshire. So hi, Rob. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, well, I'm stoked to be here, first of all, if not so I'm from Acadia Mountain Guides. I'm the climbing school manager, uh, kind of getting in the track of becoming an area instructor and um, backcountry ski guide and huge backcountry skier and skier as well. Um, but I, most of my work is centered around kind of running the operations of Acadia Mountain Guides uh, climbing school out of Maine. Uh, we're an AMGA accredited school and we've been around in our kind of full robust state since 2001, teaching avalanche courses, um, mountaineering, guiding backcountry skiing, mountaineering, ice climbing, on um, those things. In the summer, we uh, do rock climbing in Acadia. We also do quite a bit of community outreach um, with webinars such as this, uh, and then working with uh, local schools and uh, kind of middle age to high school age kids and promoting the sport of backcountry skiing, which is uh, tons of fun. So thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks so much for being here, Rob. Really appreciate it. And uh, really appreciate the uh, awesome work that you all do at Acadia Mountain Guide. So thank you. Cool. So the agenda tonight, um, we're really focusing on uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, so as you can tell from our panelists, we've got a ton of really great uh, experts here. Um, feel free while we're going through these zones to uh, drop questions into the chat. Uh, we're all going to be keeping an eye and, and answering questions. And then I'll occasionally pull a couple from there that uh, will probably be good for the whole group to discuss. So um, really looking forward to running through all this and uh, yeah, we'll dive on in here. Um, so first and foremost, um, you know, before we dive in and start telling you where all the goods are, we're not going to tell you where all of them are. We've got to leave some fun, but most, uh, some of the best spots to get started. Um, we really want to make sure to remember that the backcountry is serious business. Um, you need to make sure that you have the right gear, um, the right appropriate education, skill level, um, you're paying attention to the forecast and trip planning. You're using guidebooks like uh, David's wonderful um, book, um, you know, making conservative decisions, remembering that, you know, you're really on yourself and got to be self-reliant. There's no ski patrol in the backcountry. Um, if you don't feel confident, go with a guide. They're a great tool. I know when I was getting into it, going out with guides was really what helped me to gain confidence and understanding. Um, so make sure you have the gear and education. Um, also, this year with COVID, um, you know, make sure if you're traveling across state lines, um, you're paying attention to what the local guidelines are as far as quarantines and travel restrictions. Um, that's really, really important. A lot of these zones that we're going to be talking about are in small rural communities. 
that have limited, uh, you know, limited access to hospitals. So the last thing we want to be doing as a community is bringing COVID and overwhelming the limited resources they have. Um, so please check with each state um, and local uh, local area before you head there. Um, and then one last caveat too is in New England, um, we have a pretty unique ecosystem when it comes to backcountry skiing. Um, a lot of uh, our favorite zones are on private land with permission or adjacent to private land. Um, so it's really important that you obey signage, um, respect landowners' wishes. Uh, you know, if you see them, give them a friendly wave, and also pay attention to parking. Um, don't be, you know, some some trailheads might be in what seems like a you know quiet dirt road, but it is somebody's neighborhood. Um, so uh, really be mindful and respectful. Um, you know, if you're rolling up with skis on your car, it's pretty obvious you're a skier. So we want to make sure that that we maintain these positive relationships that allow us to access these zones that we all love so much. Uh, so the other thing too is uh, really make sure to follow these guidelines when heading into the backcountry as far as ethics. Um, you know, leave only your tracks. So, you know, make sure you're practicing leave no trace. I'm sure by the time you're going into the backcountry, you've, you've, you know what leave no trace is. Um, be self-reliant, be able to, you know, not just carry the necessarily necessary avalanche safety tools. Um, if you're going into avalanche terrain, but repair kit, layers, um, all the things that you need, you know, first aid, all the things that you would need to do if something doesn't go according to plan. Um, be inclusive and welcoming. Give people a hello. Uh, if somebody's skins are falling off, offer to give them a you know duct tape or a ski strap to help them get out. Um, really be you know model uh, model the behavior that you'd like to receive. Um, be aware of you know temperatures, weather changes fast. So ski aware. Um, ski respectful, as we said. Be aware of whose land you're on, the signage um, and etiquette. Um, and most importantly, ski smart and ski kind. So find empathy, be friendly to the people you see in the backcountry. Awesome. And then one other thing before we get diving, Vermont Splitboard Month. I'm going to kick this to Greg. It's a new initiative for this year. Um, it seems really excited. Um, so Greg, can you tell us what's going on with Vermont Splitboard Month? I can. Yeah, we, so in the past, every year for since what is it, 2014 or 2015, we've 15. been doing uh, the Bolton Split Fest um, as a gathering, as a, as a way to get splitboarders together and like build community and kind of like provide an opportunity to introduce people to the sport of splitboarding. However, with the pandemic going on right now, we, you know, large group gatherings aren't happening. And so, you know, in partnership with Splitboard VT, uh, Splitboard Vermont is actually a new kind of venture um, we reached out to some people in the, within the Splitboard community to help us run Splitboard, the Split Fest last year. And if I'm totally honest, like these guys picked up the torch and are running with it. So they're, you know, we, I really got to give a shout out to the guys at Splitboard VT or their, their whole team because they, they put in a lot of work and a lot of effort pulling this together. So the idea this year, instead of having a, a one day gathering of people, we've kind of uh, decided that February would be Splitboard month here in Vermont. And during the month of February, we've got a few different things going on. Um, there's an Instagram challenge contest. So throughout the month of February, you can get outside, get in the woods, go skiing, or sorry, split boarding, and uh, take pictures of it and share that online. Uh, there'll be prizes at the end of the month uh, for kind of uh, the best or the best photos. And I believe there's gonna be a, it's a panelist judged uh, contest. Uh, each week, there's a backcountry ex exploration challenge. So every week, there's going to be a new kind of route uh, that that Splitboard Vermont's putting up. And they, the idea is to get out and visit some of. On the route, there will be kind of like a, a a mandatory photo stop. And what you need to do is go to grab a photo there and share it to be included in the the, the exploration challenge. Every week, there will be new prizes and. Every, every person that participates also earns five entries into the raffle, which is the, the third item we've got going on, um, is that at the, at the end of the month, there's gonna be a raffle. And so you can earn entries into the raffle by doing the exploration challenge or by purchasing raffle tickets. Um, and money raised through that raffle is gonna be, go back to supporting the Cadmont Trail Association and our efforts to kind of um, you know, advocate for backcountry uh, terrain here in Vermont, so. Awesome. Um, it's not quite as good as getting everybody together in one spot, but um, we're kind of excited about it. And we're also hoping, you know, 
if it goes well, it's something that we're just going to continue on in the future um, and then wrap some of the other events like the Bolton Split Fest and the Pico Hiko into uh, just into February. Awesome. Sounds like fun. Thanks for keeping the spirit of the Split Fest moving in these uncertain and strange times. So thank you, Greg. Cool. All right. So touring on the Northeast. Uh, so we'll uh, real quick just tell everybody why we love touring on the Northeast and, and I'll start. Uh, I actually am ashamed to admit I'm a bit of a traitor to the East Coast ski community and moved out West uh, for work this year. Um, but what I want to say is that two things is the ski community on the East Coast, I kept hearing it from people that it is unlike anywhere else. And now having moved away, it really is unlike anywhere else. The passion and vibe and support and love for skiing, you just can't find anywhere else. Um, there's just this epic communal joy on a powder day and it is awesome. Um, also to me, I love the magic as you see in this photo of Vermont and New England trees on a powder day. There's just no, it just, there, there is a magic in the air when you're, um, surfing through our tight, tight birch glades. It's so, so incredible. And, and I definitely miss it, uh, being out here, those really incredible, uh, glades of New England. So, um, um, that's why I love Northeast backcountry skiing and riding. Uh, David, can you tell us what's, what, what is it that really, that made you write the book on backcountry skiing and riding? Well, I think that our terrain is unique. Um, you know, hearing you talk, Alex, and, uh, you know, I know you've moved to Colorado, but I also know you're going to be back. <laughs> every Northeasterner comes back. Um, our terrain is unique, and I think we all feel this real sense of place. Like, I love skiing out west, but then it's really where I remember one time I was skiing at Crested Butte, and I suddenly found myself in this tight glade with a friend of mine, another friend of mine, I'm from Vermont, and there's another friend from Vermont, and then another skier comes down, and we asked them where they're from. Oh, he's from New Hampshire, and we all just started laughing. Like, here we are in the land of big bowls, <laughs> And a bunch of woodchucks and all we are is is looking for some place that's like shoulder wide that we can slither through on on skis so it's just it's a bad addiction but the other thing um, I would say about the east is we've got this great history and it's one of the things I've really enjoyed writing about in my guidebooks um, our trails have stories and they go back almost a hundred years you know there is a revival of backcountry skiing now it um, you know, this is a big year, backcountry skiing's going off, everybody's discovering it. But the heyday of, we're, we're kind of just reviving something that had its heyday in the 1930s, just before all the chairlifts went up. And some of our great trails, Tyler mentioned the CCC trails. So those are trails built in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, locals all around the Northeast have been uh, restoring these gorgeous, 100 year old or 90 year old trails that snake and twist and dive and turn with the mountain. Um, and those are, you know, you ski one of these, we're going to talk about a few of those trails tonight. You ski one and you just want to come back for more. And it's just, it's really unique. And then the other thing that's just really exciting right now in the Northeast is the community supported skiing movement that's grown up with Rasta in Vermont, Granite Backcountry in in uh, New Hampshire. This is now a movement. Backcountry skiing has become a revolution. And uh, I'm, I would invite people to join the revolution. Um, David, I had a very similar experience. I was out with a girl from, who moved out here from New Hampshire and we found these really tight trees and we're like, that looks fun. Does it go? And we're like, yeah. And we're like, only the New Englanders would be like, this goes, we'll do it and had a blast. And we were like, nobody who's from out here would have wanted to ski what we skied, but we, we loved it. We were like, that was awesome. So it is really funny. All right, Greg, uh, why do you love the East Coast ski community and, and skiing on the East? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to community again. Uh, you know, I I learned to ski. I got into skiing in the western upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, where it was cold and snowy all the time. And I, I didn't really know what variable conditions uh, meant until I moved to the East Coast. And, you know, 
it's one of those things like here, like the conditions when they're really good, they're amazing. You know what I mean? Like you have, like, we've got, just gone through a stretch of just like incredible skiing, but on the flip side, when they're bad, they're, they're pretty terrible. And I think that that breeds a type of skier, a, a skier that like, that appreciates when they get a good day. And it also breeds a type of person who's ready to go just at the drop of a hat, you know? And I think that that community that we go back to, like that's the people are like the people that are here and the people that love that and are, are ready to go after that. Like that's, you know, that's, those are, that's why I love skiing here. Like the community is the best for sure. Cool. Tyler. Yeah. It's, it's um, hard to come up with something new. I think, you know, David and Greg really nailed it, but you know, for me, it's, um, it's been a lifelong passion. I was put on skis at two, um, you know, when I was a little kid in elementary school, I, you know, getting chased around, big kids trying to take my milk money, you know, it's just, I learned how to you know, get in the woods and, uh, you know, go fast. And, you know, ever since it's, um, it's been what I consider, you know, adventure skiing. That's, that's, that's the number one thing for me is the East Coast is adventure skiing really a lot with what Greg said is, you know, the good days are good, the bad days. Well, you know, maybe you ought to try some, try another sport. Um, and, but that's, but that's it. That's the adventure of it is uh, sometimes you just don't know what you're going to get. So uh, the highs can be really high. Um, and, you know, whether you're, you're creek skiing or gullies or, you know, fields, field skipping, you know, it, it's just, there's a lot of enjoyment in different ways. And uh, I really enjoy that part. The community supported aspect, which has been brought up is huge. You know, some of the, some of the glade zones that we've developed, um, I think of like Maple Villa, because that's really closest to me. It's, it's like I'm going to the post office or the grocery store. It's like you see all these community members in the in the uh, trailhead and hey, how's it going? You know, and talking about local stuff and it's it's, it's a good vibe. It's it's it makes me happy uh, to be where I live. Um, and that brings up my third point about East Coast skiing that I really enjoy is that for me it's a way of life, and you know it's part of my everyday um, experiences is getting outside and trying to climb some hill and come down and, and have a little fun and, you know, maybe make my heart beat a little bit faster. Um, and that's what, that's what keeps the balance for me. And um, so, you know, for those of you from away or, you know, down South, definitely that leap of faith. It's a good one. Um, give it some thought. Awesome. Carolyn. Uh, yeah, echoing what everybody says, the community <laughs> is for sure my favorite part. Um, like there's literally nothing better than when you're transitioning at the top of like a well-known area and you see other people transitioning nearby and you're just like talking to them about like the day that you've had and then they are done transitioning before you and you just hear them hooting and hollering down the trail. Like just sharing that stoke is the best feeling. Um, I love it. And um, I'll add to what all you guys said. Um, I really am, I feel really grateful for the accessibility that we have here. Um, like I can go ski like a crazy variety of terrain at like six in the morning and still be at work at nine um whether it's like boot packing up the gullies and smugglers notch to just like doing a quick like sunrise skin up bolt in like there's just a, an amazing variety of terrain and i feel really fortunate too that's a lot of it is in the trees because one it's like magical being in the snow like this photo is um but also uh we're um, lucky that we don't have a ton of avalanche danger so uh, we don't have like a crazy amount of limitations from that um but yeah <laughs> awesome and then rob yeah, why don't so, you tell us something about Maine because that's a whole I feel like there's some uniqueness there yeah I, I'm going there so uh, I grew up in Bangor Maine and I see a few humane people in the chat so they'll probably know Herman Mountain which is a small little uh, blip on the radar up near Bangor and I kind of grew up skiing there which was never anything that I thought would go far until I saw some pictures of people skiing on Katahdin um, being a young kid, I was like, I think I want to do that. And I, uh, I got into it. And that led me to right after high school, moving to Bethel and living in Bethel, Maine for a while, getting into backcountry skiing, uh, skiing around Sunday River off the backside there, and then um, exploring some of the GBA glades and eventually moving up into Mount Washington area, and uh, exploring those zones. So cool. Awesome. All right. So what we're all here for, so Bolton Valley, and, um, you know, this really feels like coming full circle for me. Um, I actually used to work across the street from Outdoor Gear Exchange on Church Street, and I bought my first split board for $450, complete package from the consignment basement. 
and I was living at the time on Bolton Valley. So it's where I learned to split board. And I think it is such a wonderful place where like living in Vermont to have this resource as a place to get your feet wet in touring. Cause you have this great progression from really fun inbounds touring with like wilderness being closed on weekdays to then being able to slowly inch your way further and further out into the mapped zones um, that uh, Carolyn and Greg will tell us about. And then some really proper big adventures uh, that David will tell us about that are in his guidebook. Um, so Greg, Carolyn, do you wanna kind of take us away with sort of what the, the, the more accessible backcountry that's available at Bolton? Sure. Carolyn, do you want to, do you want to lead? Sure. Um, so what Alex was just saying, um, there are two uphill routes at Bolton that are designated uphill like trails that you can just go up at any time. Um, and they're, it's called wilderness and timber line. And, um, they're literally closed to downhill skiing in the day. So you don't have to worry about safety or anything. Um, so that is just a really great resource to have for people who are just getting into backcountry skiing. Cause, um, the skin is pretty mellow. There's nothing super technical that you have to worry about. And then the ski down is also very easy to do if you're just getting into skiing. Um, and then also this is like my favorite part about Bolton is that it's Western facing so you can go up there after work and just catch the sunset from the top of wilderness or, or timberline and like my friends and i'll bring up like meat and cheese and eat it in the ski patrol lodge and just enjoy it a lot um but uh og it's been a really valuable resource for oge um in particular because bolton has been a great partner with like programming um, so we host um, events there all the time, whether um, we have like one coming up this weekend, it's like a women's tour, we're going to go up to Bryant Cabin, which I'll let Greg talk a little bit about. Um, and then uh, they also like the Split Fest is there. And it's just a great resource to have because it's also only like 20 minutes away from Burlington. Um, yeah. yeah. 30, 35 minutes. 35. <laughs> if you 30. drive fast like I do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like the nice thing is, yeah, like Bolton's got a little bit of everything. Like Bolton's kind of the perfect kind of model for like a backcountry ski resort, I, I feel like, because they have the uphill access, they, they're close to Burlington, they have this great, the Bolton backcountry has a ton of terrain, whether you're on like XCD skis or split board or AT skis, they've got, there's two cabins there, Bryant Camp is one of them, but the Bolton Lodge is another one that you can uh, take advantage of through the Vermont Hut Association. Um, it's just, uh, they have, and then and then beyond that, there's still a lot. The Catamount Trail goes through there, and that that takes you that gives you access to uh, a number of other areas. Um, in in that, there's the the Woodard Mountain Trail, kind of like heads off from the top of the um, of Vista. I mean, it's just a really they just have like a huge variety of terrain at Bolton Valley, and like there's there's really an experience for everyone. And like like Carolyn was alluding to before, you can start inbounds. Um, and then you can slowly you can slowly move out. And then the other nice thing is that Bolton Valley has kind of embraced backcountry skiing and that experience. And they, and they and they're doing a great job. They have guides if you need a guide. They have rentals. They have a lease program. I believe they invested in some of the. Don't, I hate to mention Dina Fit, but they have like some youth AT skis that have come out, and so they've invested in those in their rental program. So you can really get the whole family out there. I mean, it's a it's a place where it's it's like the perfect place to kind of um get an intro into backcountry skiing just because it is a, it's a magical place and they 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 really have everything you could ever want uh it's just like a one-stop shop for sure so if uh say i had you know gotten my setup at og and then done a few tours on the wilderness lift just to get my feet wet and was like ready to go try my hand on my first backcountry tour you know, what might be, where would you send me um, at Bolton to kind of do that first time kind of getting off into the backcountry? Heck yeah. I was going to mention this, like some beta for Bolton. If you just want to go explore some of the trails they have, um, my personal favorite loop to do is uh, if you start at the Nordic Center down there, you can go up the Bryant Trail to Bryant Cabin and check that out. Um, then continue along up to Stowview, which is this really beautiful trail that meanders through some like tight conifer trees. And then it comes out to this window that overlooks the backside of Mount Mansfield and some other valley mountains. And then you continue to meander through on, along the woods and you eventually come back out to Wilderness, which is that uphill trail. So if you can, um, if you're really tired, from shuffling through the woods for like an hour you can just ski down like a fun little ski trail um that would be my personal recommendation but mm -hmm. greg is a, a bolton expert and has even participated in the 24 hours of bolton events so he has a lot of stuff to talk about <laughs> well yeah i mean honestly alex you're probably the better one to share a split board specific route mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean the thing is is like the tour that carolyn recommended there are 
a lot of, there are a number of glades that you can, short little glades that you can hop on that connect trails. So you can do these nice little loops. You're not, they're not over, overly committing if you're kind of like, a, if it's a new backcountry experience. Um, and so, you know, they have the Bryant Trail and then there's Gardner Lane. And so between the Gardner Lane Trail and Bryant Trail, there are a number of short little glades. And so it's really easy to make like these short little hops down and then tour around back. So it's a really, and you're never far from anywhere and you're still well within kind of the patrolled area. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's a great way. The nice thing is like, as you progress, there are more adventurous, more committing options there. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, like the, the, I feel like the Bolton Valley map, the map that's on Bolton Valley's website is pretty good, but the Friends of Bolton Valley Nordic um, they have a map that's slightly different and they have a few other areas on there that are marked, uh, the yeah. glades that are marked that are, you know, kind of nice to kind of follow. Yeah. So, and I was going to say my favorite, and I think this is a good one to stack on after you do Carolyn's tour of up to Bryant and then a stove view. Once you're comfortable with that, the one that I always really like to do is go up to Bryant and then out to this called the glade. And just do that one glade from that really just hugs right along um, the Bolton to Traps Trail. Don't drop all the way down into Cottonbrook because you'll have a long climb out. But if you just do that glade, it's like high elevation, holds great snow, nice and open, mellow pitch, and you get a gorgeous tour. Um, so that's one of my favorites, but definitely make sure you don't drop all the way down into Cottonbrook Basin unless you're prepared to climb all the way out. Um, I made that mistake one of my first tours out there and actually had a skin fall off and didn't have the lace straps and had a bit of a day. Um, and then I learned always be prepared to have the ability to strap your skin on if it you loses uh, stick um, so then on to the next slide, um, because this is a photo that is off the Woodard Trail, um, which has some incredible glades out there. And David, your guidebook talks about the Woodward Trail and Bolton the Traps. And I know there's a lot of adventures if you're like, really, you know what you're doing and prepared for a big, long day in the backcountry. You can really go quite a far distance and get to some pretty remote places from Bolton. So uh, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the other like more adventuresome options once you're uh, once you're ready? Sure. And and I just have to add the rider in this photo, which is also a photo in my book, is none other than Alex Showerman, I believe. Isn't that right? That is correct. Yeah. Yes. Very pretty form there with a beautiful backdrop of ice falls. Uh, but, you know, I think of Bolton as um, uh, kind of a hub with spokes that radiate out and each with different big adventures. So you've got the step, the inbound stuff, um, you know, inbounds of Bolton is backcountry. Uh, but then you have some big tours. This is on the Woodard Mountain Trail, which is a six mile run. If you do the whole thing, it goes from the top of Bolton Mountain. You can ride a chairlift. Um, or skin, uh, however you want to get there. Um, Cheryl is a pretty nice option because it does get you to a good, pretty quickly. Um, and then there's a series of powder bowls that um, come off of this trail. Uh, then one of my other favorites and is, and really probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular section of the Catamount Trail, I don't know if Greg can correct me on that, is the Bolton the Trap Trail which is uh, got an interesting little story. So the Trap Family Lodge is of course a, a legendary cross country center and lodge. And if you've seen the sound of music, that's the Trap Family Lodge, that's the Trap Family. And um, Johannes von Trapp who built that lodge told me the story of the Bolton the Trap Trail that in the early seventies when his family was trying to figure out they had just come from Austria. And he thought that the future of skiing was hut to hut in the back country. So he cut a trail uh, along with a gardener lane who was a pioneer from the Bolton side. And they thought this was just gonna be the cat's meow. You know, everybody would jump on it. And um, Johannes von Trapp told me he was shocked that the, the people visiting his lodge really just wanted to ski on groomed cross country trails for years. But all that has changed now. And Bol the Bolton the Trap Trail now is a showcase there are uh, oodles of options of off that trail. 
tons of powder skiing, tons of variation. So um, those two trails, Woodard Mountain Trail, Bolton the Trap Trail are two to keep in mind. They're great adventures and a ton of powder. And I think you've got another slide here, Alex. Yes. That gives you another teaser. Uh, yeah, welcome to the kind of the Bolton zone here. <laughs> and, you know, people just got to say, all this talk about the ice coast. People always ask me, oh, how do I like, I don't ski ice. I only ski powder days. And uh, here's proof. That's what I always tell everybody. I'm like, they're like, oh, how's all that ice? And I'm like, really? Most of my days in the backcountry in Vermont were pretty awesome pow days. Um, just like these two pictured here. Um, one quick note for split borders, um, both the Woodward Trail and the Bolton the Traps um, have a lot of really fun once you get to know and kind of do some of your own homework. There's a lot of really fun um, more vertical oriented uh, glades off of them. Um, if you kind of go out to do the day, uh, like do them proper, you're going to be doing a lot of day in split mode. But um, like Woodward Trail, what I would do is use the Woodward Trail to get out to some of my favorite glades, spend the day lapping the glades, and then actually skin back up to the resort and then end my day with a usually like a sunset lap down Cobras or something, which was always really fun. Um, so as a split border, those are usually how I utilize those zones. Um, I did uh, I did bolt in the traps a couple times just for fun. I actually, oh, I can't share that story because I don't know if it, I guess I can. We did a bolt into traps on a fat bike ski once, but I don't know how okay that was. <laughs> um, it was a fun adventure. We pushed most of the time, to be completely frank. <laughs> um, so I would not recommend that you try fat biking the Bolton the Traps Trail. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, moving on. Um, so Brandon Gap. So this is more central Vermont. Um, this is a really one of those, like this was sort of Brandon Gap um, and Rasta really sort of, I think, uh, I think we're right about the same time as GBA founding, or you know, they both were like right within the same year or two. Um, really sparked this revolution that that David talked about of um, this community-oriented backcountry. Um, and Rasta, I believe, is a uh, subchapter of Catamount Trail Association. Um, so, Greg, would you like to to kind of kick it off and and first tell us a little bit about Rasta and who they are and and what they did and and then uh, why why we all should go check this zone out. Yeah, Ross, I mean, Rost is a great story. You know, um, I really have to get, you can't mention Rasta and not mention Zach Freeman and <laughs> Angus Tusker. Uh, those, two guys, those, do, those two guys were, were, are, were men with plans, you know, back in the day, you know, and that was, you know, that same year, I think it was like the, it was the summer of 2013 that we actually, at the Catamount Trail Association, we hosted uh, at our, our June, our summer retreat, we invited David and a number of other people to come talk to us about kind of like explore like what the future of backcountry skiing in Vermont looked like. Um, because we were starting to recognize at that time that like, you know, we were, we were focused on the Catamount Trail solely at that time, but we were, you know, at the time like Casey or Amy Kelsey, who was our executive director, myself and uh, Emily Light, uh, all, of, all of the staff there were all more kind of downhill oriented skiers and not, you know, and not that we didn't enjoy the Catamount Trail, but it was on most days that's what we were doing and we're, and we're seeing this progression in like equipment and, just, and interest everywhere else and so but then that fall Angus and Zach kind of put together and invited us to participate in uh, the first Vermont Backcountry Forum um, and it was at that it was at that time that we really recognized that this was a thing you know and like and Angus and Zach had these plans for Braintree Mountain Forest and for Brandon Gap um, and, and I feel like that's kind of where this whole thing on the East Coast started. And those guys deserve a ton of credit for um, all the, what they, the idea back then, and then all of the work that they put in since then to kind of like bring these things uh, into fruition. So, uh, so Brandon Gap, Brandon Gap is kind of unique because <clears throat> it was the first kind of like um, public ski zone to be developed on US like federal land. Um, and that kind of really kind of kind of established the model. You know, I mean, this was an idea back in 2013 and it really didn't, I don't, I feel like 2000, when was the, the work was first done in like 2016, I think 
yeah, 2016 is when we actually started working on the glades and it wasn't really, that was not a great snow year. And so it wasn't really until, until 2017 that people really got to enjoy it, but it's a, it's a long process. And so, you know, that project really kind of established the model for, or like started to establish the model for how glades could be developed on kind of public lands. And so, I mean, the history here, I mean, this is a historical project um, and being the, the first of its kind. And so at the same time, it's a pretty incredible zone. You know what I mean? It's, it's huge. There's, there's actually four zones at Brandon Gap um, and all with their own kind of unique character. And it was laid out in a, in a really, they really intentionally, um, you know, just like you would like a ski resort. If you think about like a ski resort, you have green trails and blue trails and black trails. So you have kind of an experience for anybody that wants to be there. And Brandon Gap's, Brandon Gap's kind of the same way. It's, it's well-marked, there's an uphill, well-marked uphill tracks uh, on all of the zones. Uh, Sunrise Bull is kind of a relatively short zone. It's about 500 vertical feet and it's, and it's probably the, it's the mellowest terrain there. And it's a great place for like your, the new backcountry skier to kind of go explore. Uh, then you have like No Name Zone and Goshen. And those are kind of more intermediate terrain. They're longer, they're longer descents. You're looking at like 1100 to 1300 feet of descent. Um, and these are like continuous fall line descents. They're just wonderful, wonderful skiing. And then the kind of the fourth area you have there is Bear Brook Bowl. And that one's, that the train there is a little bit steeper, a little bit more rowdy. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's just a wonderful place because you do have, you know, everybody, there's something there for everybody. Um, and in some ways it's kind of, you know, it's not, it's self, it's human powered skiing for sure, but it's such a facilitated experience. There's a map, you know, if you go to the Rasta website, you can download a PDF map that's geo-referenced. So you can open it in an app like a Venza. And then when you're out there, you know where you're at, you, you, you know, it helps you stay found. The trails are marked, there's parking, there's kiosks at the trailhead, there's parking lots. I mean, it's just a really like great experience. And we've seen, and it's seen a ton of use since it came online. So, um, I don't know. Brandon Gap is a, a cool place and it holds a, kind yeah. of a special place for, I feel like any, all backcountry skiers, skiers in Vermont know of Brandon Gap because it was the first one. It saw a ton of attention. Yeah. And I, ju I just want to add there that Zach and Angus have done an amazing job by creating a community like hyper local to their area. They host trail days all the time where skiers can come and get their hands dirty by helping maintain these trails in a sustainable way. And so people literally get to use like the fancy clipper tools and like clip out like the schwack and stuff. Um, so it's, it's really cool to establish that connection of like, hey, this is what this land looks like in the summer. And like, I'm helping to make it look a certain way for rad skiing in the winter time. So I think that's pretty unique for them too. Yeah. And I would also just like to mention those trail days, they go a long way to making sure that this is like safe, it's safer terrain. Like you can, you can ski here in lower snow conditions or more variable conditions. And you can't, you can never be sure that there's nothing under the snow waiting to grab you. But at a place that's as well maintained as Brandon Gap, you can ski with a little bit more confidence knowing that, uh, you know, it's skier earlier in the season, it skis later into the season because of that. Uh, that additional maintenance and that kind of love and care that's given to it uh, throughout the fall. So, um, you know, some of the places that we talked about in, in at Bolton that are off, like they don't, you know, somebody's maintaining them, but they're not seeing kind of the, um, the, the, the sheer amount of maintenance and love that like someplace like Brandon Gap or some of the GBA zones are gonna see, so. I want to also call your attention to the upper left corner there where it says Vermont Huts Association. Uh, since I'm on the board of that, uh, <laughs> there is a backcountry hut right near there. And actually one of the next big projects of Rasta is to cut a, a whole nother zone right around the hut, but you can stay in the hut. Um, and somebody in the chat is saying a shout out to RJ. That's mm -hmm. RJ Thompson, the, the mover and shaker and executive director. So yeah, hut skiing in Vermont. Um, also want to add to to every all the great things said about Rasta uh, just to, to explain to people what Rasta stands for kind of speaks to how in, unlikely this whole thing was. The Rochester, now they call it the Randolph and Rochester uh, Area Sports Trails Alliance. So, you know, when you think of skiing in Vermont, you think of Stowe, you think of Killington, you think of these kind of marquee names. Nobody thinks of Rochester, Vermont. And that's the whole thing. This is a rural community that um, you know, they've essentially put on the map with backcountry skiing. And that's one of the things that I think is most special. You know, they've, they've made backcountry skiing be this great resource for this small rural town. And uh, 
I think that's something that both Rasta and Granite Backcountry have done a huge service because, you know, these are towns that are struggling to find ways to make it. And who knew that backcountry skiing could be the key to, you know, prosperity there. Yeah. I was going to say also Rochester in the non-COVID times, make sure you plan to stop in that town. It's small, but it is some really wonderful, like the books, there's this old bookstore, bakery and coffee shop that is amazing for breakfast. The uh, There's a pub in a barn behind the bed and breakfast on the green that has awesome beer list, great food. It's such a cool little community. And also in the summertime, they have like low key, some really good riding. Um, they've been doing some awesome building. And then there's some un unmapped stuff that if you go by the bike shop in the summer, um, it is a really cool town. I think it's a town that's only going to get cooler um, as they continue to build out the ski infrastructure and continue to build out the trail infrastructure in the summer. Um, it's, it's really a cool place to check out. Um, so a couple of notes first, just a couple photos to get you stoked on the zone. Um, also, um, parking is a bit of an issue, uh, with success also comes the parking problem. Um, so, uh, you know, make sure that if you get there, get there early, uh, or if you will head there, get there early. Um, if there's multiple lots, so if you get to one and one lot is full, um, head to the other one. Um, you know, in the non COVID times, um, if you can carpool, but obviously that isn't an option right now. Um, but really be mindful and obey the signs. Um, you know, we don't want to have any issues where parking leads to loss of access. Um, so make sure uh, that you are uh, getting there early and, um, and planning ahead um, and maybe even look for some options nearby if for some reason you get skunked on parking. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, you know, we're kind of advocating for, you know, like know when the high use times are, right? Like Saturday from like 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., like it's going to be busy. Um, everybody else, that's one other. So if you have the ability to go at a different time, like go early or go late or go during the week, you know, during the week, you're going to have, if you can, if your job or your situation allows it, like get out there during the week because you're going to have a lot less, there's going to be less people, less parking problems. Um, and you might be able to take advantage of that storm that hits on Tuesday versus waiting till the weekend. Um, also, you know, we're advocating for having, having a backup plan, have a plan B or a plan, and maybe even a plan C and a plan D, just because if you show up and the lots are full, it's not acceptable to kind of like shove your car in the snowbank and just like hope that you figure, like worry about it later. You know I mean? That's, it causes like these are narrow roads. They're high up in the mountains. Plows have to get by. It it causes real safety issues if when you do that. And so um, we just like follow the rules and un understand that like you might get you might not be able to go there if the parking lot's full. So yeah, and speaking to access a little bit more. Um, actually, today Rasta made an announcement that they will be closing their other backcountry zone called Braintree. If you guys are familiar with that. Um, and that's a really popular zone, but unfortunately it is very adjacent to private land, like Alex was saying earlier in this webinar. Um, and unfortunately some two skiers um, interacted with the landowner and there was just a kind of an altercation there. And so the landowner was upset and uh, they had to close this area for the time being. And they have a solution in the works, but it just is like a really good lesson to always be kind to everybody you see on the trail and just like be respectful to everyone you see in the parking situation. So we don't lose access to these amazing areas that we have. Thank you both for that. Really important. Um, you know, definitely always want to remember the landowners. It's their land and they're letting us access. Or if they're adjacent, they usually have granted permission still to be like, yeah, it's cool that you come near my house um, or near my backyard. Um, so if you see a landowner, you know, always be gracious. And if they ask you to, you know, hey, can you please not be on my land? Um, you know, please, please listen to that. So awesome. All right, Mount Escutney is another really cool zone. Um, and I actually never had the opportunity to ski it before I moved, which bums me out. But Carolyn, I know you had a fun adventure there uh, earlier this year. So do you want to tell us about a, about Escutney? 
Yeah, I like Escutney for a lot more reasons than just, than just the skiing there. So I'm going to start with that. Um, as I was alluding to earlier, um, outdoor recreation, unfortunately, is associated with like a pretty high financial barrier to get into it, um, skiing especially. And Escutney has really tackled that issue head on by affording a really um, accessible, like affordable place to go. So lift tickets do not exceed $15 to ski there. And like, yeah, they only have a T bar and a J bar, but it's such, it's such an awesome opportunity for getting your kids into skiing. Um, and it's really close by and has like a lot of parking availability too, for that access. Um, but yeah, Escutney is really cool. It was a ski mountain back in the day. I unfortunately don't know the years maybe david does um but uh there they've uh, as you can see in the map they have this highlighted section is what the j bar and the t bar access but all that upper stuff you can skin um it's open to the public which is super cool but you know you still want to be safe um yeah it's really fun uh they it's a little bit farther south so i don't get down there often but uh earlier this year they got like 40 inches of snow in two days so we made the two hour trip down there to take advantage of it and like same deal the community was just reiterated there like everybody was stoked like, like having a great time taking advantage of this local area. Um, yeah, I had a great time there. So uh, for all those folks who are in Southern New England, like definitely recommend checking it out. <laughs> I'll just add that um, in addition to being great skiing, um, the whole Escutney scene is a part of, uh, I think a, a growing movement and an important movement in Vermont to reclaim old ski areas. Uh, so there are a number of these uh, throughout the Northeast and uh, for you folks who are looking for even more ways to waste time and not get work done your day, you should check out the New England Lost Ski Areas Project, nelsap.org, and then you can pretty much kill off whatever work you were planning to do that day because um, it's just full of these, you know, basically every town in New England had a ski area. And, um, you know, you might just go and check out and see what's still there. So. Right now, the, the live kind of revivals, Mount Escutney is one, and this one is pretty advanced. I mean, the community has really kept these as great uh, open backcountry terrain, the lower section. Uh, you know, it was kind of a mediocre downhill ski area, but it's a great backcountry ski area. Uh, another one uh, that I include in my book is Dutch Hill in way southern Vermont, down by Bennington. And there, a backcountry group has revived it, has restored the trails, and um, it too is rising from the weeds and the brush to have a new life as a backcountry zone. And, um, you know, one by one, uh, this has been going on in a bunch of places, and it's a, it's a really exciting community development because the community has really embraced this, but it's also great skiing, so... Mm -hmm. Well, and I will add that since these are old ski areas, parking usually isn't an issue. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's one, of the added, that's one of the added bonuses of some of these kind of reclaimed ski areas is that they usually have massive lots. So um, the terrain that it can easily handle a, a slew of backcountry skiers. So um, if you're looking for a sure thing, these like reclaimed ski areas are, are probably it. Yeah, and they're good for early and late season because um, uh, like Greg was alluding to, like there's no like snow snakes in the woods that are going to take you out and hurt your knees. Like you can just stick to these uh, old ski trails and have a lot of fun still. <laughs> now, Carolyn, you should tell the story that you were just out there after like a 40 inch dump. How was the skiing that day? I was you know, a friend to <laughs> asked me to come along and I was like, no, I think I'm going to pass. But so you went. So tell us how your awesome descent went. Well, you know, we went the day after the storm, so the snow had some time to settle, and it was so heavy that you had, like, you couldn't ski it unless you were way in the back seat. Uh, I also, like, went to pee in the trees, as one does when they drink too much coffee, and sank to my neck. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it was a fun day, but, you know, <laughs> but that, like, that's a, a good point. Like, uh, make sure you keep an eye on, like, the, the forecast and the snow and know what you're getting into, because we thought we were going to have blower pow, and it was just, like, cement, <laughs> but still fun. Which, uh, which goes to the most important thing in your toolkit as an Eastern backcountry skier is a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, I also, Carolyn, thank you for bringing up the bit about the rope toe and the T-bar. I actually learned at Northeast Slopes in East Corinth, and it was $10 a ticket. And I can say I probably would not be a snowboarder. Um, if it were not for having that access, because nobody in my family skied. So being like, hey, can I have $80? And at the time, that was what Killington was. 
like it would have been like no but it was like hey can i have ten dollars to go go ski with my friends at northeast slopes and uh there's so many awesome rope toes around um you know i think the other one is cochran's up in richmond that i always think of northeast yeah. slopes the scutney um i love the rope toe culture um, yeah and uh, we just have a question in the chat here yeah. um like all these a a areas we've been talking about are, are in vermont but uh vermont i think has like some of the strictest covid restrictions in uh, the country right now so if you if any of you guys intend on traveling here there is a mandatory two-week quarantine um or you can i think the other option is you can quarantine for seven days and then get a covid test and if it's negative then you can end your quarantine early but um there are signs on every exit of the highway that list that information, Joe. Um, you know, we're just trying really hard to keep our small rural community safe from the virus. It does. There is there is an update every Tuesday. Um, and if you are, if anybody's interested in coming to Vermont, you can go to the Catamount Trail website. We have a COVID page, which makes the relevant information a little bit easier to find. Um, so yeah, it can be a challenge to travel. It can be a challenge to travel here right now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, uh, Jeff and Josh, for asking. All right. So there's some Escutney photos. And now moving on to Vermont's wonderful neighbor, New Hampshire. Um, and Tyler, uh, do you want to take this away and tell us about Bald Face and, and what's going on here? I'd love to. Uh, Bald Face is probably my favorite uh, GBA zone. Um, it, it, represents almost everything I love about skiing. It's, it's got, it's got, it's got a bit of everything. It's, um, you know, it, it's got this above three line skiing, uh, opportunities that I like to call wilderness skiing. And that's on the, the summit cone. It's got, uh, the ball face knob, which is about as close to West coast skiing. You're going to get here in the East. And then you've got some pretty, pretty sweet blade skiing as a run out, you know, total, uh, total, if you're, if you go to the summit, uh, which is not on this map, well, the summit is on the map, but the, uh, the vertical in our guidebook and so forth is 2,500. But if you go to the summit, it's 3,000 vertical foot drop, which, you know, I like that. That's a good number to see. Um, it means you can have, it means it's a full day of touring. So, um, you know, the way I like to ski this zone is, um, well, first off, it's, it's, it's a long skin end. It's a four mile. So you got to be ready for that, right? It's, um, yeah, there's a bit of a barrier to entry for most. It's, you know, there's all in the Alpine environment, Alpine, the lift serve environment, there's always the stories about taking your girlfriend to the top and, you know, taking her down a black diamond. This might be sort of similar to that, you know, the the equivalent of uh, taking a newbie out. This may not, maybe not the best first uh, day tour. However, you know, you can ski the lower elevations. There's plenty of fun blades, you know, down below the knob. But no doubt, it's four miles in um, and for, those of you that, that have been out there, you know what that means. That's um, it's a bit of a slog, but um, you know it's also a, a barrier to entry as well. So you know, depending on how you look at that. Regardless, you know, it's um, you get into the right. There's a um, you gain the uh, top of the Slippery Brook Trail, which is a hiking trail, and at that point you have a choice. You can you can skin down into below the knob, and so you can take a look at um, you can take a look at conditions, snow quality um if you so choose and you know some days it, it may be a little maybe a little dicey in there you know so it may not be a bad idea this might be a good time to say bald face you know it's probably not it, well it's definitely not an early season choice for me if you um if you're any one of the quarry dogs which is the name for gba volunteers who come out and cut you'll know that one of the biggest important the most important things about glading is that now you know what's underneath and you know, this talk of snow sinks and so forth, like, well, that's real stuff. And, um, you know, the way we, from a forestry practice, for a best practice is we lay the slash down, we cut up into smaller pieces. Yeah, sure, we try to fill out some holes and, and so forth, but it's, um, you know, right, right after cut, it doesn't look very good. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a dance floor, put it that way. Um, and so it takes a few seasons for that to really settle down. So, that, that is an important thing. A bald face, you get up on the knob and there's these boulders that are as big as cars and, you know, <laughs> you wonder if bears are living in there. And I mean, it's like, it's a wild place. Uh, now the benefit of, of it being that way is it's got a Southeast uh, aspect and it's very much um, in the Lee and it acts like a little Tuckerman ravine. 
with those northwest winds, that you know, giant fetch zone just dumping snow right in there. So it does fill in, there's no doubt about it. Um, and that's really the, the beauty of this zone is that in my mind, it is an alternative to the presidentials. Um, that was one of our um, strategic choices when we when we were able to work with the White Mountain National Forest is that we wanted to diffuse traffic of one of our initiatives among several others. And so that's what this zone really offers is really a, a really nice alternative to, you know, the uh, the traffic and, and, and all of that that goes on in the Prezi's. Um, at any rate, so going back to this tour, so um, as, you, as you skin up Slippery Brook and you see that on the map here, it's that low dotted line, the blue uh, diamond. Um, when you reach that junction, that's that's really your uh, the choice that I was talking about. You can dip down in and take a look up. You know, myself, I like to just, you know, I skip that step generally. I'll just climb right up. Um, and there's a little, this is like a, there's light mountaineering practice on that next skin to the top of the knob. It's like a 0.2 mile. Pretty steep, you know, in the wrong conditions, you definitely, you know, you learn as you, as you, as you become a little more seasoned in the sport, you learn that um, trying to huff and puff up a steep skin is um, it's a lot easier to take the skis off and just go up. And you're gonna, if you're out there for a long day, um, you know, it's better to reserve some energy. But when you get to the top of the knob, it's like, man, it's like the world is your oyster. You know, it's, um, it's any which way you want. What's important is that is the exits out of there. Yeah, that's an awesome picture right there. So um, Jamie Walter, by the way, side note, scored all three um, pictures on the guidebooks this fall. Uh, David's book, um, President of Skiing, Kurt and Eilers book, and our book, uh, Granite Land. So this was a, a sunrise shoot that we did uh, for Powder Magazine. Uh, they did a feature story on GBA in um, fall of 2019, I believe. And um, so, yeah, you get up early. You know, this is like a... 3.30, a trailhead start, um, you know, that's a good opportunity for some shots and just, you know, great, great area to ski. So, um, you know, the way I ski, I, I like to think of bald face as, a, as like video game skiing. So you get to the first level, you can choose whether you want to dip in or you go up to the top of the knob. I like to go to the top of the knob. If you can get one or two runs in, awesome. If you're there really early, which is how I like to do it. It's, you know, like I said, it's, it's all yours. And you can see the terrain in that picture that it, it very much is the West Coast skiing. And that's part of our project zone, but we, you know, we haven't had, haven't had to really cut into that. The, 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 the real initiative on this um, project was um, getting the exit, cleaning that up. And Bald Face is a very difficult mountain. Any split water out there that goes over, they're going to hear this talk. And like, yeah, let's go hit Bald Face. You're going to get it run out of the, um, um, the, the the knob and you're going to ski some glades but then all of a sudden you're going to hit like a half mile of flats and <laughs> i can't tell you how many times i've heard the complaint like what do you guys what are you guys doing like putting the skin track like you know on the flats um and i'm like well <laughs> you know that, that, that wasn't intentional okay you know this is called landscape and just natural geography and uh, sometimes that's what you deal with and that's probably why it's not a resort um so you have a little bit of that on the exit but at any rate not quite there on the exit so you can climb back up, you can skin right on the knob. Someone usually will set a skin track. And so again, very much West Coast. And then my move is, um, you know, especially if it's a nice day, you got to get to the top. So you got to, we're on this map here. Um, yeah, the summit. There's a whole bunch of wilderness skiing up here. The cone, when you get on the top of the cone, first off, you have this insane view of Mount Washington, which is very unique. Absolutely encourage that. You can ski the west side, the south side, the east side, um, and it's it's kind of it's pretty fun skiing. Definitely recommended. And then you get back to the knob, and at that time, all the people all the people that rolled in at ten o'clock, you know, start showing up, and um, you know, you're ready to maybe do one or two more and then get out of there. Um, so the getting out of there is um, you know on the go back to the knob. It's these are like 800, 1200 vert lines. Uh, they vary a little bit, but when you get back to the exit glade, it's a long run out, um, a lot of just fun little glade skiing. Um, and and um, so when you pack it up, the important thing to talk about here is that there's this place, this very special place called the Stowe Corner Store that I need to need to say right now that I you all must go there. Uh, amazing, like award-winning food and um, 
Maureen and Big Jim there, just super awesome. So it's it's really the only only game in town there, but it's it's well worth your stop. So I'd encourage that. Um, but ball face, yeah, real skiing, um, good place to test your metal, and um, you know, yeah, it's a lot a lot of fun. So I don't know if Rob or anyone else has been there wants to pipe. David, I know you skied there. Um, if you want to pipe in on on ball face. Quick question for you, Tyler, um, yeah. and sorry, David. Um, what is the um, slope angle, and do people need to be prepared for any possible avalanche danger as it is above treeline? Yeah, thanks for saying that. Cause I, uh, you know, both the zones that I'm about that I'm talking about, bald face, and then we'll talk about the black and white glade. They're definitely are, are really our only two avi zones. Um, the slope angle, you know, varies, but it probably gets up to about 40 degrees at bald face. Um, oh. This big rollover. So you have a lot of natural anchors there with the trees. You can kind of see, but you know, that's that's not going to hold back something that's ready to go. We haven't had or heard of any incidences at this time, but you know, um, it's absolutely. So I wear a beacon when I'm there, and I suggest and recommend, strongly encourage everyone. You know, buttons up as if you're going into Tuckerman Ravine. That kind of ment mentality is very important. You're a long way from your car. Um, yeah, winter travel is really important. What's in your pack? You know, um, we talked about that at the beginning of this episode, and I, I think that folks really need to know exactly what's in your pack. You know, the night before, I always lay my stuff right out on the on the ground and pack everything up i leave you know nothing to pack in the morning because you know i'm, I'm just not with it in the morning it takes takes a bit to to come to so um you know that's just a little practice tip on what i do um but yeah be good then it's an avi path for sure avi zone for sure yeah, and does this um does this zone i know mwac recently expanded their forecast area outside of beyond just the bowl does does is this relevant to the MWAC forecast area? Well, I, well how it's relevant in my mind is um, I uh, if like I said it's a similar aspect to say Tuckerman Ravine uh, some at some parts of Gulf of Slides, so you could take what's being forecasted and apply it to those slopes. So it's not it's not going to be dead on. It's a you know there's a, it's a different you could say it's a different microclimate over there which which it is, but at the same time, it's, um, you know, similar aspect. And so, um, so there's some, there's some, um, you can glean some information from that. The other thing I would say, which is important is a great backcountry. One of our, um, we want to retain the backcountry feel in these zones. I mean, you know, there, they are, you can call them manufactured glades. I mean, we are cutting to ski it. So whatever your position is on that, regardless, it's, you know, it's, uh, we want to have that wilderness experience. So we have limited signage to avoid visual clutter. And, you know, that's why we have all of our glade zones in Avenza, you know, so that you have, you know, to, to, um, uh, you know, to fill in that blank for you. Um, obviously it's nice to have other non-electronic forms of information like a map, um, in your pack, but, it's very difficult when you ski off the knob, there's one keyhole, let's see, you can see where it says number six and five meet, like that's um, that's like a keyhole where it's like number two flows into that. That's hard to find. Um, and that's a shorter run, like go, that's why we, we, we were able to expand in four and three and that, um, those are, I mean, that, that, that whole area over there, that's long, that's run, that runs big, you know, 1,200 and, um, that's that's like the best skiing but six could be great you know it's five and six is great on the way out five is a newer line it's a little skinnier it's um that's a fun it's got some nice pitch um in the trees um wormhole like and uh so that that line there is is yeah a lot of fun and so you could you could you know you spend a lot of time up here at ball face i know there's certain people do um you can really get to know it there's there's just there's there's a there's really a lot on that knob that you can ski and you can keep going um, north and it's quite open. There is, there is a cabin there, not a cabin, a lean to, and you can see it above number three um, where the um, bald face knob trail is. Yeah, right there. So you could certainly uh, spend the night there if you'd like, you know, you got to climb up on some slabs and cut over uh, to get into the skiable zone. But when, if it's your first time, you'll, once you see it, you can kind of get a good read on it. Again, def, that's, that's, probably even more so of um avi prone there's just it's just slab straight up slab on that side but mm. yeah a lot of good stuff over there um one other question from um 
from uh, the chat is how, what's the parking situation? Is is like Brandon Gap? Is this a concern? Um, do people need to get there early, or do we need to be worried about that? Um, it's a great question. So, you know, this is an area that yeah, the lot the lot gets filled, right? It yep. definitely gets filled. People park on the side of the road. It's you know, I, I don't want to say that you know you need. It's just I think it's an accept. I don't, it's an accepted practice over there all summer. I mean, this this area gets um, quite a bit of traffic and there's some way more in the, in the summer. The parking lot is limited, um, but it is, it's a pretty quiet area. You're not exactly in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, what I would say is use your judgment. You know, if you're um, like Greg mentioned, if you're if you got two wheels that are like above your ears after you park, um, you know, that's, pr that's probably an indication that you shouldn't be there. Um, if you're, you're able to pull off and there's, you know, um, a bit, quite a bit of area to park and, you know, you're not on the road, then, you know, then, that, and that's the important thing. That's the message that the ski kind message is you have to, you have to think, right. Cool. Um, and it sounds sometimes kind of silly, but you just think, um, is this the right thing to do? Um, am I being a good neighbor? And, um, so you can apply that rationale to what you're doing, but if there's definitely overflow there, I, I would, I would absolutely say that. Sweet. Um, David and Rob, sorry to jump in. I just wanted to make sure that we had that avalanche safety discussion. Um, but what, you know, any other thoughts to add? What's your experience been? This place sounds so cool. I'm really bummed that I haven't made it out there. Yeah. Move to the photos, Alex. This is, yeah. this is all about the photo. There we go. Oh, oh, okay. We only got the one, the one gorgeous one. So that kind of says, you know, photos good for 10,000 words. You know, Tyler could have just said two words and gone with a photo and said, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. So this is big mountain experience. It's something to work up to. Um, and, you know, you can also do a more modest, you know, if all you have time and energy for is some of the glades lower down, you can just ski up and uh, ski the lower angle glades that are part of the exit route, which just feel like they go on forever uh it's really fun when you're skiing out they're just mm -hmm. the glades go and go and go um so it's it's just a fantastic resource you know bald face has been talked about in whispers for years by white mountain skiers mm -hmm. so this is really put on the map a place that was kind of mythical and mm -hmm. when you ski it you, you see why it's a pretty spectacular area yeah, and I'll just I'll just jump in and say the practice the etiquette there too is um, if you're gonna if you want to ski some lower angle glades, you could you know you skin right up the bottom of the glade. If you're going for the summit, you're going for the knob. You take slippery brooks. Not only is it faster, but you know it, the glades definitely narrow as you get further up. And so you know just from a etiquette perspective, but you know like this year I've got a couple of young kids that's that's on our list. We'll skin up ski what we can they're not going to make it to the top um not this year um but that's so that's okay there's, there's a lot of room down low yeah also i just want to uh, decode here when when alex mentioned mwac so that's the mount washington avalanche center which is mount washington avalanche center.org which posts daily forecasts for the high presidential range and as Tyler said, it, it's, you know, you can sort of extrapolate from what they are talking about, um, about the stability in the high peaks, but um, they also have, they'll say something about the Sherburn Trail on there. It's, um, you need to bookmark that at every backcountry skier in the Northeast. That's an important resource. It's an essential resource if you're going high in the White Mountains, but, um, you know, so get used to checking the avalanche forecast. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tell you, I'll say right now that um, if anyone's out there listening and wondering about the forecast, please do not email me. Do not email us. We don't, we don't forecast. We're not meteorologists. Um, you, you know, you got to use what you got to be resourceful, right? You have to um, think about what's at your fingertips. You have MWAC that uh, David just talked about. You have Mount Washington Observatory. They have a higher summits forecast. You have Wildcat. Um, on that side, you have Bretton Woods on the other side. You, these guys pump out, you know, some marketing reports as well, but marketing snow, we call it, but whatever. You can glean some information from it at, at minimum. And um, then you have local forecasts and, and 
maybe some pictures that you can find online, but, um, and Greg probably has this experience as well. You know, we, I can't tell you how many, how many messages we get. What's, how's this skiing? How's that skiing? Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the nature of the game, like backcountry skiing. I mean, you know, you got to figure it out. I, I, I was going to say, we, we do, we, though we do kind of encourage it, you know, we want people to use the areas. Um, so we do, rec we, I mean, we do see a lot of phone calls and emails, but we kind of encourage people to reach out. Um, oh, you just set yourself up. Like for us, it's an excuse to touch base with people. You uh -huh. know, usually we're, we're basically, we don't have information. We're like, check the local forecast, check the Nordic centers and the, you know, your local Alpine shop, Alpine resorts. Uh, and like, and you kind of get what you get, right? It's backcountry skiing in the East. Mm -hmm. So um we do, we, do encourage, we do encourage it just because it gives us an opportunity to touch base with people. I was going to say another really good resource that I like that I found to be really um, pretty spot on, both when I was living back in the East and even now out here, um, there's an app called Snow Forecast that you can literally just drop a bunch of pins on the map on all of your favorite ski zones, and it'll pull up like a point a point forecast with like hour by hour breakdown of like snow day by day, you know, what the temp is, the wind speed. Um, and I love that app. I've used, I use it all the time to kind of track as storms coming in, see which of my ski zones that I'm, you know, I'm thinking about going to is going to get more snow or which is going to be, you know, get more wind and, and really use that as a tool. So kind of pulling together all of these resources, you can really start to understand, oh, is, is this going to be the day for bald face? You know, if you look at the snow forecast, that point for snow forecast and are like, oh, it looks like it's going to get it good. And then, you know, that day you check, M, you know, MWAC and, you know, it's like, oh, okay, we see it was like low winds or, you know, whatever the forecast is for that day, all the stars starting to align. So pulling from all these different resources is really, I'm constantly checking all of these different resources to make my tour plans. So awesome recommendations, everybody. Yeah, I'll say, um, I just want to pump in about the GBA network. It's, it's really cool how it's developed sort of organically, but now, you know, as you like I, when I dial up a tour, it's always like it's, presidential is like number one for me. That's like where I am. That's where I want to ski. But part of the reason of creating GBA was, you know, this high avalanche days, weather's uh, well known to be mm -hmm. you know, notoriously bad. And um, this creates that below tree line network where it's a little safer in the trees. But now we've, we've, we've expanded all over the place that there's an analysis. There's an analysis on the prezies, you know, mm -hmm. all right, we're going to ski, you know, Huntington, we're going to Oaks, you know, where are we going? What's the wind doing? Blah, blah, blah. But now there's this analysis that can be applied to the glade zones, right? We're going to Franconia, we're to Cool J, you know, what are we going to do? And there's this hypnosis down in Madison. I've got this newcomer with me. That's a good zone. Hey, bald face, you know, that, that might have something special happening over there. So it, it's cool. And that, that kind of spreads people out. You got to make a choice, right? You, you have to ski it all in one day. You got to make a call. And um, that's part of the analysis. And that's what makes it fun when you, when you hit it. And you score, no one's there. Um, you know, that, that's a good feeling. We, we can move right into black and white. Glade. Oh, yeah, I wasn't trying to move you along. I just, no, no, I'm happy to talk about it. Because, um, you know, uh -huh. one, um, if, if, yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. And actually one, one quick question for you. And I know we, we do have a little bit on Mount Washington, but um, what are, you know, I know one of the biggest sort of causes of tragedies on Mount Washington is people only hear of Tuckerman's and they get there and it's a high avi danger day. And they're like, I drove six hours and I've been dreaming about it all year and I'm going to do it come hell or high water. And I know that with now all these GBA glades, um, there's like plans B, C, D. So uh, what are some of the glades that are sort of in the vicinity to Pinkham Notch that, you know, if somebody's planning a trip to Tuckerman's and the, the stars don't align for their weekend that they set aside, what are a couple zones that we can point people to within your network that are nearby? So that way people aren't forcing the issue and, and can still have a fun time if they, they traveled, traveled all that way. Yeah, I would say plan B zones are, um, um, you know, you have Bill Hill and Gorham. Uh, and that's a really fun little zone. It's got, um, it's like 600 vert. It's pretty, the access is pretty immediate. Um, that's supported by co op Cycling Club up there. And there's a great crew of guys and gals up there. Um, and that's when Crescent Ridge or Mapleville or Pinkham, um, you know, are out or full. That's a good place to go. You know, zone up in um, 
uh, Mount Prospect in Lancaster, you know, Mount Prospect's a unique mountain because it's like, it's like a standalone mountain. It's not like in a range. And so that can be um, a negative in terms of its snow accumulation, but it's got this cool community. It's got a ski toe there. And one of the reasons we did that glade is because they were struggling. The ski toe volunteers were struggling and people just weren't skiing. And so we're like, hey, let's put some glades in, in and around this thing um, and really spice this thing up. And um, so there's some good terrain over there. It's um, it's some nice pitch in there. So that's absolutely. And then also um, I would say down in Madison, um, New Hampshire is a fun little zone, um, smaller, 400 vert, definitely like newcomer, kid friendly and um, uh, great owners there. That's private land. You know, the cool thing about GBA is something that's been a strategic initiative that I've, uh, you know, really been, been, um, really placed as a high level of importance is, you know, initially we got two projects in the natural forest, but it's like, I don't want to rely merely on the natural forest and, and working with that great partners, love them, but you know, a lot of red tape going on there. Those projects, you know, a little slower than I'd like. Um, you know, I like to like to push these things along, but you know, we have, we have, um, we work with basically five different landowner sets. We have federal, state, municipal, land trust, and private, and we have zones with all the different landowners. So it's a, a nice mix um, of folks that we work with. So, awesome. yeah. And then yep. black and white, this was the, the two that you picked for, for taught for really focusing on was, um, was bald, uh, bald face in this one. So why, why black and white? Why should we all check this one out? Well, it's interesting because I maybe should have thought about it a little bit more, but, um, you know, bald face is really, um, initially that was designed as, as an alternate, an alternative to the, the, the Prezies, the whites, like I said, but it's very much a Portland skier destination, um, just the way the geography and the way the Cold River Valley and Evans Notch is. Um, but black and white is 100% main skiing. And this is a place where I cut my teeth a long time ago skiing there. Again, it's got this similar bald face. It has a um, an open summit feel. That's a cool picture right there. That's kind of coming right off the summit and just, just about above the glade zone. But this is a really cool project. And this is, I think this is our, if it wasn't our most recent project, it's one of them because um, it just shows to the, the depth of experience that we have at GBA and to get these projects done. It's it's a three, well, I'll call it a four partner project. Um, Mahusik Land Trust owns the, um, um, the Rumford Whitecap Preserve. It's 1100 acre zone. And so they were the initial partner. Then we brought in um, Black Mountain of Maine, which is a ski resort. So that was a strategic initiative to have start working with ski resorts. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, over there, Black Mountain of Maine, to the right-hand side there, lookers right of the screen. Um, so that's a ski resort. And there's the fourth partner is the Angry Beavers, which is a, a group of volunteers at Black Mountain of Maine. And they've, if you like glade skiing, I would recommend Black Mountain of Maine. It's um, it's a it's a nonprofit. It's a, a good vertical, and there's there's glades all over this place. You know, it's pretty unbelievable. Uh, Jeff Marcou and his crew at um, the Angry Beavers just they're like relentless they just they just get after it out there and so if you live in the area I definitely recommend helping those guys out too um but not only is it a, essentially a four uh partner project but it's very unique in the fact that it's a point-to-point -point traverse um so you and and it includes two communities um, the bethel andover community and then on the other side with black mountain the rumford community and so that's 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 a big deal it's two mountains um, and you have, it's an eight mile, eight miles in between. So one way, so you can ski this thing a couple of different ways. Um, you know, obviously park, you could drop a car or you could just do a lollipop, but, um, so it has, and it's also has, which is an important piece for the, um, um, our side of it from the management side is it has some sensitive ecological features, including red pines as the largest red pine, um, forest uh, tree stand in the in the state of Maine. And so we had to work with um, MNAP, um, which is the Natural Areas Program in the state of Maine. Um, and but these red pines are they're really cool. And if, if you go back to the um, that little 
drawing at the beginning that has some of the specs on it. Um, you know, we like to feature some of these things. If you go back, well, yeah, so they have little red pines in there uh, on our Glade posters. And these are for sale, by the way, if anyone's interested. Um, so, you know, if you're coming in from Andover, um, you, there's a nice rewarding skin track. One of the best things that I, I love about our zones is that we really put a lot of focus on our skin track um, because that's, that's in and of itself, it's its own experience. It's the opportunity to kind of, you know, get in your own head and um, have a good wilderness experience out on the willy wax. Um, so, you know, climbing this thing, so you, seven and eight on this map starting from lookers left there. Um, you know, those are fun, fun glades. I, I like to think of them as like exit glades, just like on bald face. Um, you know, I think of the, that run out glade as an exit glade, just like I think of the Sherby on Mount Washington as an exit run, you know, um, but they're, they're, they're in and of themselves. They're, they're a lot of fun. We had to do a little work on eight and seven. Um, and there's another, there's another line there. Um, we haven't updated this map yet. I, I think it's in, um, it's coming out like, yeah, probably yesterday, but, um, there's another line we had to work on. We had some low snow issues last year. And, and as Greg can probably, as could, Greg can likely attest, you know, these zones, you know, they're work in progress. You know, you do, a, you, you put some effort in one year, that doesn't mean it's done. You got to let the see how the snow falls, the wind hits it, you know, the, how's the sun, the sun effect. So we had to do some tweaks on this west side. Um, but then there's a beautiful skin, um, a ridge, summit skin, 360 degree views. And it's, it, it's a little longer than you maybe like, but it's, um, but man, it's just, you're out there. You're in the middle of Maine. It's like, it's, um, it's, it's, it's God's country, you know, it's uh, endless views. It's gorgeous. And you can, you can really ski on all sides. You see, there is a private part, uh, property indicator. So just be cognizant of that, but where four, uh, five and four are, um, that's, it's pretty much open. It's open, um, uh, field skiing for, 400 or so vertical um and you can just lap that but you know like i said we've been skiing this for a very people skiers have been skiing this for a very long time the, the deal here just like ball face is like all right how do we manage this zone so that it works is um, that where this photo is tyler yes yep yeah. and this is dropping right into like um i think number five there was a waterfall yeah. um cool. and and then you can then you can skin skin back up or down if you go back to the map for a second um you have the um let's see down by that yes yeah, it's helipad landing so it's like a nice little area to have lunch or, or what have you then you can skin up the black and white trail this is a this is a hiking trail in the summer by the way um so it's a good if you're a trail runner out there it's a sweet little run uh, but then there's and there's so there's two glades out where it says number two there's actually another glade that we cut this fall and again that's in the updated map that's not here um, so there's two options. Well, this one, number two is the Mary meeting. There's one to um, just south of it there, which really is next to the hiking trail that's called the Bear Claw. And those are off the back of Black Mountain. Uh, it's really cool. Um, so black and white, I will say, because you're probably going to ask me this, is this an Abbey zone? Yes, most definitely. I would I would wear your beacon. Um, have I ever heard of it sli uh, slide? No, but if you, you know, if you're, aware skiing aware then you can um, assess this to see that it's got the slope and open shape that um you know definitely could slide no doubt um the other thing i'll mention is black mountain maine they have a beautiful lodge great place to grab some quality craft beer and whatever else you like but um there is i just want to mention because it's important for our partnership they they um there is an uphill pass there. And so I think it's $15. And so it's, it's the, uh, it's the honor systems. So there's a, um, a link to, there's some maps that are down at the bottom that you can pay online, but you can also pay at the ticket window, but that's an important thing to, it's a nonprofit, you know, we're trying to keep them, support them in their community. They serve a great community. Um, again, um, really helping that out so this is this is just a really fun zone i think you might see this year or next we might do a um some sort of rando race um here there's a lot of opportunities with it uh, but some good skiing here for sure of, of any really of any skill level i would absolutely recommend it yeah this, this is a good um that's a good perspective there of that the open skiing just being crushed turns um and it's what, you know, it's one of those places that you're like, you get down to the bottom, you're like, God, why isn't that longer? You know, I could just ski that forever, you know, uh, it's got just beautiful pitch. Um, 
Yeah, then I don't know. There might be one more picture. Um, yeah. Ooh, that's a pretty one. Yeah, so they also, um, I think on um, Waterfall, uh, there's a little, there's a cliff. It's not mandatory, but there is a nice little cliff if you like that. But then you get in here and there's a whole bunch of, I call this the, I'm like, I took this picture. I'm standing on like a, what I call the whale back. It's just, just ginormous rock feature that is, well, it looks like a whale. And you can ski to the right of it and you get, it's just a cool perspective. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, cool elements to this tour. And it's, um, I just want to give thanks to Mahusik Land Trust and Kirk Siegel, the executive director, because they've just been huge in helping us work with this land and um, the Rumford and Bethel communities, you know, just a long history of skiing here. And so now to bring in the backcountry skiing, it's just, it's kind of like where I live in North Conway. It's it just adds a new element of skiing, you know, you got Nordic, you got Alpine, you got backcountry. It's like, what's better than that, you know? Um, so a lot of good things happening in Maine. And um, I think there's, there's some more in the pipeline. So, um, so good stuff. Tyler, I just want to say, this is like, you all have done amazing work. This is like, I, I unfortunately didn't get to make it over your way, but um, like hearing you talk about it and seeing these photos, like really impressive work that you've all done. So um, congratulations. And, and I'm excited to continue to see the success because I know you're still hard at work. So amazing. Oh yeah. It never ends. I appreciate <laughs> it. It never ends though. Always more. Cool. Um, so moving on, uh, David, I would love for you to, to kick this off. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't read his book, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about it is um, he does some incredible um, storytelling around the history um, and um, really helps you understand the sense of place and magnitude uh, and importance uh, that um, these areas like the Sherburn and Mount Washington have not just to Northeast skiing, but um, the entire, you know, ski industry and, and the entire backcountry ski community. So David, I'd love for you to, to take it away and, and tell us a little bit about, uh, about the Sherb and, and why it's so, so important to, uh, to, to backcountry skiers and skiers everywhere. Well, one thing that, you know, Mount Washington is legendary as, really the center, the heart, and the beating heart of skiing in the whole Northeast. It's the home of Tuckerman Ravine and some incredible steep skiing. But it's also home to what I think of as the best, you know, if, introduction to backcountry skiing, introductory backcountry ski trail is the Sherburne Ski Trail. So if you're wondering what this is about, you know, you've got the gear, you've heard about this, but how do you start? Uh, you could do no better than the Sherburne Ski Trail. There's no avalanche issues and, and anything to be concerned about. So this is a trail that was cut in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps because of the growing popularity of skiing uh, above it in Tuckerman Ravine. And that little photo there, you see that slash of white and that, that's the Sherburne, but above it disappearing into the clouds is Tuckerman Ravine. So way back in the in the late 20s really the first forays to get in there and see what's the skiing like in tuckerman's was happening and they were thrashing their way up the cutler river it was just a stream bed to get to the good skiing well word got out photos got out and soon very soon by the early 30s uh the appalachian mountain club was running snow trains from north station in boston up to uh, to get up to Mount Washington to ski, but they had a little problem, which was how do they not thrash people in that stream bed? So they cut the Sherburne ski trail. And uh, to this day, and now we have uh, new guardians of it, Granite Backcountry Alliance uh, is now the volunteer uh, maintainers of the trail, which is really great because this trail has gets a lot of attention and it's needed more love than it you know, it needs love to keep it skiable and fun. So anyway, it's, you know, two and a half miles up gets you to a, a bunch of cabins called Hojo's. And then uh, the ski descent is two miles on the Sherburne. And like all, it's got the characteristics of all CCC trails, um, which is that it twists and turns and moves with the mountain. Some of that was by necessity. The CCC only had hand tools. They didn't have dozers. They didn't have dynamite. 
So they had to move with the mountain. If there was a ledge or a cliff or something, they had to move around it. They couldn't just blast the thing into submission the way you do today. So that explains the other thing that, you know, I, when I first began writing my guidebooks, I interviewed a lot of the old timers who cut these trails, not realizing I would very often was the last interview that they did. And I heard them talk about that they cut trails for themselves. <clears throat> they wanted to make it interesting. And interesting was twisting and turning and dropping and rolling double fall lines, all sorts. Of, I think of these trails as having a sense of humor, you know, because <laughs> you're getting comfortable, you're cruising, all of a sudden the trail drops off in a double fall line, turns in the opposite direction, and you're like trying to defy gravity to hang on. So all of the CCC trails, um, Vermont has a bunch of them, the Bruce Trail, the Teardrop Trail, uh, the Steeple Trail, New Hampshire's got the Sherburn, a double head Black Mountain. These are all in the North Conway area. Um, and they are just, you ski them and you just want to come back and ski them again. It just puts a smile on your face. They're fun. They're funny. They're cool. Um, they often hold the snow. They're At this point, they're pretty popular. Um, Tyler and his volunteers, his mad dogs have done just a great job rerouting the old double head trail so that it skis better to a new uh, parking lot. Um, but it's unbelievable that a century after these folks cut those trails and the CCC was an answer to the Great Depression, these were unemployed men from the cities, um, that a century later, we are still skiing these things and still loving them. So that's the Sherburn. Mm -hmm. um, David, now I think like, several of those trails became like resort trails, right? At Stowe and whatnot. So yeah, for like the trails. person who's more of a resort skier on here, like, could you say like these CCC trails really influence sort of what resort skiing would be in well, New they England? Didn't just, they didn't just influence. The yeah. CCC trails became the nucleus of many of the big modern ski resorts. So mm -hmm. Wildcat, uh, Stowe, um, Cannon, these were all built around CCC trails. Mm -hmm. And the fact that skiers were already coming in the thousands to ski these kind of clued people in. This was a low risk investment to say, well, let's just put a, a, a chairlift up that thing. But a lot of these trails never got a chairlift. So some mm -hmm. of them got incorporated like the Wildcat Trail and Wildcat Mountain, that, that's just now a downhill ski trail. Um, but the ones like the Sherburn, ones like the Bruce Trail on Mount Mansfield in Vermont, they didn't get a chairlift. So they still are, you know, you get to ski wild snow and, um, and all the joys that you get by going in the backcountry. You know, three, there's really like three realities um, from the CCC trails. They're, they're either embraced by the resorts, take, you know, adopted, and as David just said, they're somewhere left as standalone like the Sherb. Um, and then the rest were, were abandoned and forgotten. And so the Maple Villa Glade Zone that we developed is an example of an abandoned um, CCC ski trail. And so that was our initial idea uh, to when we when we decided to form the organization is how how do we you know how do we um, present this to the general public to the to the older guard to all these folks you know what's the compelling story we could tell you know and it's boy it's reviving an old ski trail what's better than that you know that just connects it full circle and then what we do is we use that in maple villa for example we use that as the main artery skin track and we have you know that's where the glade all the glades come into that so mm -hmm. we design modern ski practices with glade skiing with the old historical trail and um that's a good story right there that's awesome. bring it all full circle and I'll also, I just also want to say, because there's this thread on um, the Facebook backcountry touring page, which I'm sure we're all too familiar with. Um, what is the proper etiquette on skinning up? Do you skin up the Sherby or do you skin up the Tuckerman Ravine Trail, uh, AKA the TRT? And our GBA's position and Friends of Tuckerman Ravine's position um, is that you skin up the Tuckerman Ravine Trail. That is uphill traffic. Um, just as you don't ski down the TRT, okay, you know, there's trail conflict, you ski down the Sherby. So I would just recommend um, 
folks and encourage you to um, think about what you're doing, where you are, and um, try to stay out of other people's way. It's, you know, everyone wants to have a good experience. So just think about the greater good. Um, and I do would say that the TRT is faster, if that helps. Um, but I just wanted to make that point. I was going to say the TRT is a way more pleasant skin and then you don't have people coming down on you and you don't have to worry about it. Like, it's, I don't really see why you would ski it, skin up the Sherb. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a lot of, you know, that's like, we're talking about before the episode here that, um, the issues at resorts and I see some questions in the, in the chat room related to this, but, um, you know, you have this inherent conflict uphill versus downhill. Like at some point that's not going to end very well. You know, we all know that inevitable conclusion there so you know we apply that to back countries like you know when you're forced like uh, at um you know black or double head or gulf slides you know mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's all that's the only that's the only way to do it but sherby come on go to the trt you know it's fine um it, it, if you want to hang your head if you want to pick your bat you know if you want to pick your battles maybe there's a better one to pick so yeah. um that's all i just want to throw those two cents out there um and then on this this photo here, uh, you know, I want to give Rob a chance to chime in. We can see um, Tuckerman's, we can see Huntington, um, and we can really see the, you know, some of the marquee alpine terrain in uh, the Northeast. Um, Rob, can you, you know, so say I'm, you know, I, I've come, I've done the Sherb, uh, you know, I, I've kind of started to get my backcountry legs under me and I'm ready for a new challenge and, and kind of looking up into the bowl being like, or, or up at, uh, this is Hillman's highway, you know, I'm looking up at that and I'm like, boy, I want to check that out. Um, what education, what steps, how, how do I progress from somebody who went from the resort to now being able to, you know, comfortably tour some of these, these zones we've been talking about to, to taking that next step to, into this big terrain. Yeah. Like David said earlier, going up the TRT or skiing the Sherbert and it's all overhead there. Once you get the Hojo's, everything you see above you is just uh, a big Alpine circuit. It's, it's quite awe-inspiring and definitely makes you want to get into that train. Um, I would say, as we've mentioned before, um, avalanche education is key, um, and there's lots of great area providers on the East Coast. Uh, so an area education level one course would be phenomenal um, and spend some time poking around in some of the GBA glades that have some steeper terrain uh, and see what you can learn about snow and, and really taking a level two um, and working your way up through that progression if you want to spend a lot of time in these backcountry zones uh, is super important. Um, and uh, as you see in this uh, photo here of Hillman's Highway and the other lines nearby that uh, in this photo are quite filled with snow, which they aren't at the moment. But uh, this, this is certainly complex avalanche terrain um, and very challenging. So there is required skills such as mountaineering skills, the use of ice axes and crampons to stay safe in this train. Um, and all that takes a large learning curve. So as we stated at the beginning, there's always a, a great way to get education is to go with a guide uh, and go check this stuff out with uh, somebody who spends time up there and can teach you the skills you need. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, you know, one of the things that are that are becoming somewhat you know, lost in this age of um, screens and, and so forth is the idea of having a mentor. You know, it's, it's really, if you, you know, a, a guide is great. Yep. Absolutely. I endorse that hundred percent, but also if there's a, you have a mentor, someone that can teach you the ropes, you know, tour with that person, mm -hmm. soak it in. That's really important. That's like a lost art. I feel like everyone's, everyone hops on the Northeast touring backcountry page mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't, doesn't research a, a bit of anything and throws a question out when, you know, if they had spent 30 seconds, they probably could have figured it out themselves. And so, you know, I just encourage people to, you know, go old school and um, go with people that know what they're doing. And um, um, that's, that's a good way to do it. You'll learn some real yeah. practice tips that will be helpful. Um, and so a couple of quick things, uh, just, you know, I, I wanted to, oh. Can I just respond yeah. to this question real quick? How does, oh, yeah. how does how does someone go about finding a mentor? That's a really great question. Um, a couple of my ski partners now, uh, back in the day with Time for Tuckerman, it was a website that's no longer exists, but it was this like beautiful resource and it was basically a forum. Um, and I met some ski partners on there and 
then I had to go home and tell my wife that she's like, who are you skiing with? And I'm like, oh, so-and-so, like, where'd you meet them? I'm like, oh, online. <laughs> she's like, what? Um, so I, I'm not encouraging necessarily to, to do that or not, but either way, um, you know, what I suggest is, you know, GBA and CTA and all these groups are very um, community oriented as we've touched on going to events. You know, we have wild corn coming up in the spring, glading, um, you know, in the fall, all these organizations do that. Um, and, you know, getting your avalanche course, course certification. Uh, these are all opportunities to meet people. And just like you meet anyone in, in real life, you know, the you know, relationship has to develop, but uh, it's the same thing in backward skiing. It's not going to all happen overnight for you, but so you got to have a little bit of patience. Um, but that's what I would recommend how you find a mentor is start talking to people, be social. Yeah. Um, I was going to say also, um, you know, getting like I, when I, I was going to put a plug in for Acadia mountain guides, I took my airy two with, um, Al and John and, um, you know, Al I've kept in touch with, I think it was like maybe five, six years ago, I took my airy two and I've kept in touch with Al over the years. And, um, he's been an incredible mentor and resource. Um, the other thing too, I was going to recommend, um, for any, uh, women on here, um, the women's backcountry Facebook groups I have found to be really awesome for meeting um, meeting women who are you know maybe similarly skilled or a little bit you know like out here I connected with I just got a snowmobile and I connected with another woman who just got a snowmobile and like it was we've been like <laughs> learning together and it's been really fun so um, those can be some great places in addition to the uh, events um, as well to kind of find some touring partners some of the bigger groups I've found to be not the most productive but does anybody else have like pointers for finding a mentor and finding touring partners because i know that's a really go, big barrier go hang out at um ski the whites it's like the dorm rooms over there and um <laughs> i just hang out over there i walk in i'm like don't you people have jobs um but and what andrew's building is ski the white friday night lights another big one it's last skier standing he does those events um uh, we have one this saturday auto um but it is, these little these towns um you know they have these little re, the retail shops uh you know you just yeah just poke around and, um it's out there carolyn and greg i know that oge and cta regularly team up on uh events uh you know that are great for meeting mentors and touring partners is that happening this year with covid uh it yeah. is yeah Sorry. I was going to say, just, just as of the other week, we were kind of green lighted to, uh, to be able to run our tours this year. Like every year, we run a, a, a number of tours, both like Nordic backcountry tours. We have a, usually have a handful of splitboard tours. And then we also have a lot of kind of like alpine touring or down, more downhill related tours. So, but like, yeah, I mean, if you're looking for someone to ski with, like you, you got to get active in the community and you have to be mm -hmm. social. Like if you're not going to be, if you're not the friendly type of person, it's going to be a little bit, it might be a little bit hard. So yeah, look for tours that are run by places like OGE or the CTA uh, and get involved on during the fall, during trail work days. I mean, you get to know the terrain. You also get to know some of the other people that are out there. Um, I mean, you have to, you, you got to get out there and put yourself out there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say we have when it's not COVID, we have events like every single week, like both on snow and in the store, um, like whether they're clinic focused or just like a way to go and get outside. And like, um, we're not the only gear shop in Burlington. And um, there's like a bunch of others like Ski Rack and um, Alpine Shop that do stuff like that, too. And same with I'm sure in um, like North Conway, I think like IME has events like pretty frequently, too. Um, so I think gear shops are like a great resource. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank you, everybody. And that was an awesome question. Um, who asked that? Um, Sina, and sorry if I mispronounce your name, but thank you for asking that. That was an awesome question. Um, Amy also gave a shout out to She Jumps, um, which is another great resource um, for women who are looking to get into the backcountry. Uh, and then Abby mentioned uh, if you're um, BIPOC and live in Vermont, um, follow Unlikely Riders and check out unlikelyriders.com um, to connect with uh, fellow BIPOC folks in the community. Um, so thank you, Abby, for, for that. I know I've been seeing you do a lot of great work there. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, 
And cool. So as we near kind of the finish here, uh, moving on to Mount Katahdin, um, which is uh, really quite the adventure. Um, that's actually where I took my airy level two with Acadia. Um, we stayed uh, up at Chimney Pond in one of the huts up there. And it is remote. It is wild. Katahdin, I think, really doesn't look, it looks kind of like it was just dropped there in the middle of this kind of flat northern Maine landscape. Um, and it is, it is a cool place. It's hard to get to. Um, but Rob, do you want to tell us about Katahdin and, and kind of what it takes to, to ski this, this wonderful place? Yeah, it sure is a, a wild place. As you can see from this photo here, looking out into that cloud bank, there's uh, not a single other hill other than the brothers out there uh, poking out of the, the sky. So it definitely comes out of the middle of nowhere, just north of Bangor. Well, not just north, a couple hours north of Bangor. So uh, it's a ride to get there, and it's also uh, quite a bit of travel to get in. Um, the park itself, Baxter State Park, covers over 200,000 acres of land. So it is a vast swath of of terrain that you can go and explore. Um, but moving on to really what it takes to get in there, as you asked, is it's 13 miles from uh, A Ball Bridge into Roaring Brook, um, and then another three to 3.3 ish uh, into Chimney Pond, which is really kind of the main center for where you want to do all the skiing and alpine adventures. Um, from there, uh, there's bunkhouses and lean tos to, to access. Uh, the terrain and, and spend the night um, but they do go fast uh, I always suggest having some winter camping skills and being able to book a lean-to uh, you can really make a flexible itinerary if you go that route uh, if you lock yourself into the bunkhouse you might show up for uh, two or three days and really get no skiing in there spending a good amount of time in Katahdin is your definitely your best bet for success um, also just like couple other notes as we will jump through the the technicalities here of what it takes to get in there um as a skier rider technical climber that's what you have to register with with the chimney pond ranger so you must have certain equipment which uh includes an ice axe crampons uh and a few other things so definitely be sure to pay attention to the baxter state park rules and regulations uh as you're looking to get in there um and again this is an area that's that's way out in the middle of maine um, there's no avalanche forecasting up there. So it takes a lot of skill to assess the snowpack um, and be able to, to travel safely um, in this terrain. Uh, you definitely need to be prepared to self-rescue um, if a disaster is to happen as your, your rescue is, is miles away. But as we can also see, the, the skiing and riding is absolutely incredible up there. Uh, so I believe this photo is popped in there by Tyler um if he wants to maybe tell us where that's at and what it's all about that looks pretty sweet yeah so um you know but as as rob was saying um you know most most well let me step back and say the beauty of baxter state park and is some people have issue with this but um there's a little red tape not as bad as it used to be but there's capacity restrictions and you know you compare it to places like the whites i mean the whites are like a junk show compared to what it's like in Katahdin you can have a you know you can really have a, a really true um outdoor experience and the white the whites it's just heavily congested so it's nice um juxtaposition there um uh, what I was going to say with you know Rob describes sort of Chimney Pond and I mean there's just there's just some great skiing in and around there um North Basin a little north of there um it's good stuff in there this picture was more on the the south side um, I have no idea what these lines are named. I, I've skied in here twice. I think once in 2011, once 20, this was 2017, I think. And I'm headed back there this year as well. But um, yeah, this is more on the um, Southeast flank. And the coolest thing is you get up on the tablelands um, and any, every aspect, I mean, there's, there's skiing like everywhere. It's, it's insane. Um, it's so remote though that you, you know, and, and it's hard to judge where things are, or how far away it's, um, but the winds are, the. It, it's possible it's worse. I want to say it's worse than Washington, but um, the effect is potentially worse. And part of that's because of, you know, being sort of a standalone mountain, it just gets absolutely wind hammered. Um, you know, we've had days where we're like hovering on like 
29 degrees and I'm like, please, you know, please, Lord, let the sun come out or something to like corn this up because it's a little dangerous right now, you know? Um, um, so it's, it's a place that, um, you know, going back time and time again, it's and just getting to know the terrain is, is really important because it is a wild place, but these lines, uh, stuff that you see from Millinocket, and that's primarily the stuff that I've skied a lot of those, a lot of these long gully runs. I mean, they're like 2000 vert plus. And, and of course they, when they close out, they close out and you're hiking back up. It's not like, Oh, I'm just going to ski down the Sherby and go to my car. Um, it's a little different. You, you're hiking back up. You really got to think about travel times and, you know, darkness. But again, I keep saying what's in your pack, but that's a real question. Um, and just figuring out, you know, what your plan of attack is, but, endless amounts of skiing here it's just it's just an amazing place i'm 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 from maine uh born and raised and remember when i was 15 or 16 i did a summer trip with my grandfather who was 77 and we spent five days and in, in and around this whole area and he was bushwhacking like an animal and i just remember being like what this is insane like this this guy you know and he really taught me like you know how to how to be one with the mountains and uh, so katahdin for me is a, is a special place um, I, I absolutely look forward to getting back there. Yeah, it is. It, it's absolutely incredible. Some of the best skiing um, in most accessible skiing really comes out of the, the Great Basin there out of Jimmy Pond. And I think that if we flip to the next photo, Alex, I think our next photo is. Yeah. So this here is uh, John Tierney, owner of Katie Mountain Guide, skiing uh, one of the gullies coming off the saddle trail there. Uh, and as you can see, he's throwing a little bit of snow up there. It could be a little windboard, uh, but it also could be a little soft. Um, and and as Tyler said, the weather up there, uh, as it is on Mount Washington, is is quite wild. Um, just the way it stands out of the middle of nowhere, uh, it does get quite a bit of snow. Hopefully, we'll we'll fill in some of the lines that are up there this year. From recent reports, it's pretty rocky, um, but it's really a wonderful place and super wild david writes about some really cool adventures in his book with the uh the traverse um across katahdin which is is just mind-blowing um adventure skiing awesome cool. yeah and the one thing that just one thing to mention about katahdin though is that um I, 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 did, I threw out there, there's a little red tape, but, and it's regulated. It's, it's close. I mean, April, best season on Washington, right? Corn snow. Woo well, not so much in Katana. And things shut down at the end of March. So it is what it is. Yeah. But something, a fact, good to know. It's a little tough living in Bangor with that happening. We'd love to <laughs> get up there and ski some of that corn snow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, we do offer our trips into Katahdin, and um, it is a great place to hire a guide. Uh, as you can access the Sherb on Mount Washington, um, you can't necessarily access an easy line on Mount Katahdin, so feel free to, to contact the Katie Mount Guides if you're looking to get up there. Uh, we're pretty close by. I definitely would recommend uh, Tate hit like doing a guide if uh, you're wanting to do Katahdin. It is when I went up there, it's a remote and uh, it's definitely there's not a lot of beta on it. So your first trip going with a guide would definitely be a great, a great option. We're pretty um, good. Too. We can all cook pretty good backcountry food. So, <laughs> um, Cool. Uh, there was a couple, anything else on Katahdin or I, um, I got, I see a question in the Q and a or two main about, um, what is in the area near Sugarloaf? Uh, somebody's going to be making their trip up there, um, this winter and was curious if you can point them in any directions in that part of Maine. I, I, mean, I, would, yeah, I would say right away, like burnt mountain. I mean, is an easy yeah. one. It's yeah adjacent to it's Sugarloaf property and they developed it like I don't know eight eight years ago and maybe a little more maybe a little less but I remember when it came out I'm like yes like you know thank you and um it they have pulled quite a few trees out of there it's it's really good skiing now they have a cat operation so it 
the loses its luster a little bit in my mind. You you know nothing like getting to the top and then you know twenty four people you know roll out of the clown car. You know, then <laughs> um, you got to fight for first tracks. But um, that's but if you're asking for you know where to go, like right there, that's an easy an easy one. It's great terrain. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I would second that. Um, there is some uh, also backcountry skiing in the Crockers, um, if you can get in there, uh, which is accessed via a road. So the skin in is pretty good, but the terrain's rather technical and, and definitely needs a decent amount of snow. Yeah, and I'll, hey, I'll say, um, you know, we are one of our strategic and 2.0s is really making a move into Maine um, more so than we are. And, and um, the Crockers is a piece of property owned by the state of Maine, um, a BLM property. And it, they purchased, yeah, purchased it in 2014. So it's managed for recreation. And so we're in discussions with them and I don't know where it's going to go. We have, you know, I have a million projects that, I, um, that are on the runway. I have no idea, you know, how they all play out, but um, that's one of them. And so that that's, you know, 4,000 footer type stuff. And, um, so Rob, we should catch we should catch up on that. We might have a little scouting to do. Yeah, I'd love to. That's uh, I, <laughs> the Crockers will always look mighty inviting. So yeah, uh, I just want to stack tackle Steve's question here from the Q and A. So uh, he was asking Alex or anybody here what the uh, the approach to camp at Katahdin is like and whether it's beneficial to bring XC skis and kind of stash the the touring skis with the split board on the sled and. I would say yes, if you have the option to get some XC skis and can move along that trail pretty quickly, uh, go for it. There's a lot of uh, friction on the bottom of skins, as we know. Um, so XC skis are great, and, and you can really get crews in there. Um, but if you don't, um, you can just throw a lot of wax on your skins. Cool. Um. Sweet. Uh, so anybody have any last minute questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, if not, we will wrap things up. I'll give it like 15 seconds or 10 seconds. Um, I just saw, is there other uh, CCC trails that GBA is looking at? Uh, I sort of referenced before, you know, we look at everything we possibly can. Um, then there's a couple of there that, you know, there's, um, um, the one in particular is Bear Mountain that we were looking at, but, you know, it's important for me to say, you know, the national forest, well, under the existing forest management plan, we have worked with them to be, um, consistent with that forest plan. Although backcountry skiing is certainly not explicitly listed as an authorized use. Um, the spirit of the plans allowed that, but, I say that because um, the four, it's, it's just not willy nilly. We can do whatever we want. You know, there's a saturation point. There's only so many projects we're gonna be allowed. And so we have, at this point, we have to be pretty strategic, you know, about what we're gonna be selecting for trails. And um, and so that is still out. And I think, um, you know, that, that Bear Mountain is in the Saco district. We just have, we have two in the Saco district. So we're working with the Pemi and the Andro districts on other lines that are not CCC. So, um, hopefully that, that makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for all the awesome time. Uh, I'm just going to give one last quick throw to each of you. Um, so David, uh, where can people, I know you said it's the first edition or the first print sold out. So you have the second print coming out now. Where can we all go get your awesome Bible? I know I need to go get one because I just want to read the update. Um, so where can we get it? So you can get it at bestbackcountryskiing.com and uh, be happy to sign a copy to you. So that's the place to find it. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, David. And seriously, everybody, if you don't have his book, like I'm, I'm not doing it's it's I'm not doing a shameless plug. It's like an awesome book. I really, it was the first thing I got when I got into backcountry skiing and snowboarding. I love, I read it cover to cover, 
referenced it regularly and I'm sure the new edition is, you know, I know from talking to David is even more relevant to the, the kind of touring that we're all looking to do with, with all of the new zones and everything. So um, David, uh, congrats on it again. And, and uh, seriously, everybody go pick it up. Um, Greg, how can people support uh, the CTA and its chapters and get involved? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, check out our website, cadmontrail.org. Um, you can find all the information about our zones there, direct links to our chapters, so you can engage with them as well. Um, I do want to just, you know, the CTA and our chapters were member and donor supported. So, you know, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, like learn about what we're doing, engage with us. And if you, if you like what you see, consider becoming a member and getting involved because, you know, we, we, need, we, we want you in our family. So uh, come check us out. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Greg. Uh, you have been such an incredible and the CTA have been such an incredible force for fostering that sense of community that we all um, talked about. You know, I know uh, I wouldn't be in that country if it weren't for uh, for all of the Dawn patrols that I did with the CTA back in the day at Bolton. So thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, so Tyler, um, can you tell us how we can support the GBA? You all are doing such incredible stuff. So how can we be involved? Yeah, pretty similar to Greg's uh, talk about CTA. You know, granitebc.org um, is our website. We have all of our information on there. Uh, but I really encourage people to get out and come to our Glade Days. I just think that's so important to create that engagement with the land. Um, we have a big event, April 3rd, Wild Corn. Uh, which is the takeover of Black Mountain. We set the list down and um, we're still, we're still going to do it um, despite the COVID environment and we're, we have a COVID compliance policy in place um, and we were able to glade this past fall. We have an event this Saturday. So um, we're doing our best to keep, keep the wheels turning, but um, you know, we're looking to meet other people and get out and have a good time, you know, check us out, check these events out. It's a cool community. You'll be surprised to you meet. I can tell you that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. And uh, as soon as I get back to the East Coast, I need to come over and check out your zones. They sound so awesome. So um, no, thank you. Anytime. <laughs> All right, Carolyn, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I guess what I'll ask is, what do you have coming down the pipeline for the backcountry community at, at OG? What are, what are you cooking up these days? Uh, yeah, we are focusing our efforts on like uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So we're looking to plan a bunch more tours for people who identify as women, people who identify as LGBTQ and BIPOC folks. Um, so definitely getting excited to work with some local organizations to help us guide us in that work. Um, so keep an eye on our Facebook page and our website for that. Um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. As a queer woman, I really appreciate uh, you making this space welcoming and inclusive. So thank you for all of your work there. And seriously, everybody, uh, like if you're like, oh, I'm really into this backcountry thing, but I just can't afford the gear, go to the OGE consignment basement. It is an incredible magic place. It's how I got into backcountry. Um, it's such a good resource. If you're like, I just can't afford all this gear, go check out their consignment basement. It's amazing. And also their sample racks are incredible. You can find some like amazing stuff um, on some deep discounts. So OG really, uh, really helps uh, make it more approachable um, with all of the amazing different options they have to save money. So favorite shop on the planet. Thank you so much for being here, Carolyn. Thank you, Alex, for your kind words. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and then, Rob, um, what do you have? Uh, like, how many more uh, airy courses? Where can people find out what you've got offering? Yeah, so they can check us out on our website, which I dropped in the chat there. It's just AcadiaMountainGuides.com. Uh, but we got uh, airy courses running until the end of March. Uh, we got courses mostly in the Mount Washington Valley area. Um, but we do have a course that we're just opening up this week. Uh, we've partnered with Saddleback, who's kind of expanding their uh, backcountry ski zone in the next couple of years. So we're going to teach an area course up there um, this season, and uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, they can also drop me an email if they have any questions about anything from Mount Washington to Katahdin, and our email is climb at acadiamountainguides.com. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for uh, having me and uh, being here.
Awesome. Thank you uh, so much, all of you, for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended, uh, spending this time hanging out here. Um, I know for me, it felt like a virtual trip back home to hang out with you all. It was so wonderful and talk about some of my favorite places to ride. So I had a blast. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and then uh, if you want to get a jump start on uh, planning your dream trip to British Columbia. Uh, next Thursday, our Slay at Home series is going to be with Kapow um, and Kootenay Backcountry back, uh, Guides talking about British Columbia. So um, we can plan our close to home trips in the Northeast. And then for the future, when COVID isn't a concern, plan our dream, you know, our dream trips out to British Columbia next week. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Really appreciate you uh, hanging out with all of us. And thank you, Wes for giving us this awesome opportunity to, to hang out. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.